Wanna Go Pizza presents SCP. The Steve Dangle Podcast with your hosts, Steve Dangle and Adam Wilde. We've been waiting for this moment, I think, all summer. I have. I, I personally have been waiting for this all summer. A man who definitely took care of us during the Stanley Cup Finals last year in Nashville. Oh my God. Uh, a man who no. has definitely mentored us <laughs> all the way through our favorite favorite guest of all time, Mr. Chris Johnson. Uh, who's on Yay. his phone? And because it, important things are no, happening. No, I'm on you. my phone because I'm trying to figure out when Steve booked me for this. Oh. Because it's oh. like I'm I'm really good at doing this week. You know, in terms of planning, right? This this goes way back. Like I had to put at this in my August. calendar. <laughs> yeah, at least August. It was when we had our big like summit, our yeah. podcast summit. Yes, in my backyard. Pr- probably I made August them 6th. slum it in Oshawa. <laughs> um, you and I have been texting a lot. Anyway, it's somewhere before August twenty third. So it's it's this has been in the calendar for a while. Well, see, we wanted to make sure we picture. could book you before <laughs> sure. the season actually started, and you're all over the place and uh, basically MIA. Until we see you pop up on Sportsnet and on every radio show that Rogers has, uh, so we wanted to make sure we got you before that. Um, but one thing I think I'm waiting for him to call up and be like, "Are you going to renew your cable?" <laughs> 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 I, I have. <laughs> Sir, That's a great deal. Like new packages. You know. um, Can we interest you in the hockey package this year, <laughs> yeah. Steve? You yeah. get you get me. Super get a lot sports. of meat. Let me tell you a little bit about Game Plus, young man. Um. But there was a there's an incident that I think we need to address before we even get started with this. There's a lot um, of tension in the air. A lot of a lot of tension in the air, and uh, and it's a, you know it, it's something that I think, you know, both Canada and the United States felt the aftershocks of, and that is me big timing Chris at the Leafs game on Friday night. You big timed reporter Chris. <laughs> Apparently so. <laughs> so here's no. So here's oh, how because, I found out. Well, okay, I saw you, and then yes. what did I do? The lovely Mister and Mrs. Dangle. We had a nice chat. I said hello, and you're like, "Oh, there's Adam over there, down at the front, behind all this velvet rope and all this stuff." Front <laughs> oh. row. I spent too much money on those tickets for preseason. Oh, you actually bought them? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. I know. I was one of the. Just what say the, the number. <laughs> say the number. So it was a hundred dollars a ticket. You're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Really? Yeah, I did. You know, I'll tell you. Just wait a month. <laughs> I just rented my condo out, and I was like, I'm gonna celebrate because now I can, because because I did it because it's why rented. Did, but why did you celebrate with tickets to a real? Well, I mean, oh, hang on, hang on, Jesse. Uh, well, the reason. Sorry, say that again. Why oh, didn't you? No. What? <laughs> I'll just leave them on. I asked you why didn't you buy tickets to a real? Game? Why didn't I buy tickets to a real game? Is a really good question, and uh, I have no answer. I have no answer. I, no, just, you know, I just, okay. I just did. I just now I feel what? bad. I was excited. <laughs> no, no. I thought you called Adam... in some favor with some <laughs> entertainment no. thing. And... Oh, you think we get favors? Oh no, Chris. No, we get nothing. Listen, nothing. Adam chirped me for my sixty dollars James Reimer figure, and let me tell you something. I still have it. I have the memories. Okay, that's true. I but have the memories. Have had better memories. Probably could have. <laughs> yes. You have regular season memories. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> yeah, this but Jesse, the then dude. he would have had to sit all the way up with pond scum. Uh, mm-hmm. like, yeah, we could have bought the sixty dollars tickets, which would have been smarter. But I was like, no, one hundred dollars. Thank yeah, you very much. At Rico Coliseum, <laughs> you bum. And do you know what he got for his price? He couldn't hear us. We're just yelling, Adam! Adam! And he wouldn't even turn around. He's like, no, I'm in the front row. A solid quarter of Rico Coliseum was looking at me because I was screaming my lungs out. Really? Yeah. Wow. They were like, who is that maniac? So, so cause, okay, so yesterday I want to rewind a little bit here. I'm like, hey, Chris, so excited to have you on the show, whatever. And he's like, yeah, well, you big-timed me at, the, at Rico. I was like, what? So, so you had a conversation with Steve, and I was like 10 feet away, and then what happened? Was that it? You wouldn't look over. Oh. And again, I thought it's because you were just down in the fancy section eating your sushi. And <laughs> <laughs> They do not deliver sushi to that section. I was a little disappointed. Yeah. Um, well, it's okay, though. You got to see Morgan Riley's end. Of, and, oh, oh no, you were buying food. I was buying food for oh, that. Oh, yeah. it would have been nice if you got to see that up close with your expensive ticket, but yeah. you didn't. No, didn't uh, see any of even bought close. arena food. That was yeah. a pricey night. It was, yeah, it was, and it's funny because I don't think Rico was ready for nine thousand people. They ran, they stranded up, like ran out of pizza. Like, like we had to call Pizza Pizza for more pizza because <laughs> there's just that many people there, right? It's not something that's usual. And also, that's garbage. So, yeah. What? Pizza Pizza. Yeah, that's terrible. Oh, <laughs> they had to call 
uh, unnamed pizza company for yeah. more pizza. Trash. Um, we should bleep that out. Yeah, we should. <laughs> like, um, like it's a swear word. <laughs> but yeah, so I... I'm Panago Pizza. Sorry, Chris. I had I, I don't know why I didn't assume that you were there, because of course you would have been there, but I didn't see you, and I'm, I apologize. And so. there's no real tension. There's no real tension. No. no. Tension. This is no. actually worth it, because I found out you paid that much for that ticket. I know. Listen, I don't feel bad about it. I He's was excited. In your misery. You know that uh, that Austin Matthews. Do you know what would have been exciting if you paid hundred bucks for last night's game? That would have been worth it. Austin Matthews hat trick. He was and he scored two of those goals right at your end. Oh, actually, all three. Oh, great! Right at the end where you were sitting. That's yeah. cool. No, that's cool. There I, was a similar shot that went wide. <laughs> There's a similar shot that went wide against Linus Allmark, but uh, he was not the statue of Al Montoya that that showed up in net last night. <laughs> what? Yeah. What was that? that was, I mean, uh, so was that first shot? Was that one of those ones that just fools you and you get handcuffed, or or is Al Montoya? Well, just... he wasn't supposed to play the game. Oh, uh, so the goalie Charles Lindgren was supposed to play and somehow injured himself warming up. Oh. oh. So I don't know. Maybe Al. Maybe he, he wasn't had ready. a few the night before. I don't know. <laughs> maybe he wasn't at his best. <laughs> he wasn't expected to play. We're going to title this podcast, Chris Johnson Thinks Al Montoya Was Drinking Before the Game. Uh, well, and then the, I meant the day before. <laughs> not, right? And then I find out the guy backing up who wasn't even sitting near the bench is actually with the Marlies on a tryout <laughs> contract. So Montoya just had to sit there the whole game. Yeah. Well, he was an emergency goalie, that guy. Man. Yeah. Because yeah. they didn't they only brought two goalies, and one of them got injured warming up. <laughs> That's yeah. crazy. So one of the, I think the Marlies have like so, four goalies. So we lent right Montreal now. a goalie. Yeah, basically. Hey, he got a jersey out of it. We That's were actually cool. debating, like, if Montoya went down. This is before they announced the emergency goalie. Wait, the Leafs just send over, like, Cascasuo? Mm-hmm. Why not? I have no idea. Why not? I mean, it's a preseason. Who cares? Yeah. yeah. He'd probably be happy for the ice time. Um, they might not have wanted to give him a sunburn though, with the way Matthews and them were going last night. So they they like I don't want to obviously I don't want to dwell too much on the fact that you know that it was a five nothing win against Montreal, which we always love, but it was five preseason one. One. five one sorry. But it seemed like that line was really going. It seemed like they have been going since game one because those you know those are the first two guys to score were Matthews and Nylander. And they've been a, f- a major factor in, in pretty much every game that, you know, that they aren't breaking up the, the, the Hyman, Matthews, Nylander thing. What have you seen? Man, <laughs> this could be a special year. I mean, it's hard to, it's hard not to get a little bit ahead of yourself, just especially with regards to those two guys and the fact that they're now looking at a full season likely playing together, which they didn't have last year. And they are pretty filthy. I mean, <laughs> two guys that can shoot the way they shoot and pass the way they pass, I'm not sure that there's much another team can really do. And, you know, last year, Austin scored 32 goals at even strength. So he, it's only eight. He led the play. NHL, right? Yeah. Wow. He, and he, I believe he was second in the NHL in even strength shots. So basically, he was already owning the league at even strength last year. I would expect he'll be better this year just by being another year older and experienced, having Nylander all season long. No offense to Connor Brown, who spent some time there, but I think Nylander's pretty special on his own. And then he's going to be on the top power play this year, whereas last year, sometimes that was not really their top unit. They were using the Bozak JVR guys, and they were having a lot of success, at least were second in the league in power play. So I could just see a huge jump for him with power play points and him and Nylander together. Like they could, that could be the best line in the league. It's, it's not to me. It's like not out of the realm of possibility whatsoever. I mean, they are like see the goal the Islanders scored. There are not many guys who shoot the puck like that. No, like anywhere. I mean, even Phil Kessel. I don't think. I mean, Phil shot hard, and it was different the way he did it. But like that was, it's crazy how hard Nylander shoots the puck. Well, and Phil's often like off the rush. Like Nylander's right. just standing still, sniper. Have you ever seen him panic with the puck? Like yeah. ever. That whole, like, it's it's funny. The best players on the team are so, like, what makes Matthews lose his mind? What makes him, like, yell and scream and go crazy? Not a whole lot. Like, he looked bored last night. Nylander's always bored, basically. They're pretty stoic, yeah. both Have of them. Have you ever been in a scrum with Nylander that was over 90 seconds? Mm, yeah, I think he got to about two minutes last night. But Whoa. Whoa. Wow. He, he, by by his own modest standards, he was <laughs> verbose last night, but... He's actually not so bad one-on-one, Nylander. Oh, you, just, you just have to come armed with questions. Because I find if you sort of let him know that you're not leaving, he'll eventually just be like, all right, I'll actually talk to you. But um, anyway, I, 
it's only preseason. Sure, and of course it is. All this stuff can go wrong. There can be injuries and things that we can't really predict at this moment. But, man, if those two play a full season together, it's going to be something. I think, I think really that like 90 points for both of them for me is not out of the question. <laughs> so wow. We can stop talking about the Marlowe thing. It's not going to happen. No, I don't think so. Okay. Now, again, pretty ab- thoroughly. Yeah, <laughs> absent I- absent injuries. I think that that. I mean, because th- this is the counter argument to Zach Hyman. I mean, Matthews led the league at five on five, shot, second in shots, first in goals, with him on his line last year. So, I mean, it's not like Zach's dragging him down. I think people just looked at the twenty nine assists and said maybe he should have had more. You know, if he had more finishers on his line. Well, now he does in Nylander. Right. I mean, last night, him and Nylander just going back and forth, and Nylander just scores from the top of the circle. Mm-hmm. And Zach Hyman had a fight? He did. That's it was I mean, such a preseason fight, though, but between two surefire NHL players. Like, they were both like, all right, we're mad. And then the second they both had their gloves off, they're like, uh, let's this not get is hurt. dumb. Let's yeah. not break a hand here. Let's yeah. not lose money. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and Brendan Gallagher has broken his hand a couple times. Oh, exactly. So I'm pretty sure he's just like, he's he's yeah. he's willing to engage, but only so much. Um. You know, with with the way the team, you, you kind of knew going into the season what spots were available, right? And and even even so, I you know I I would never have called going into the season that that fourth C spot, the fourth center, would be up for grabs. I would never would have thought because you oh. just assume that well they signed an NHL player, a guy with a great faceoff record, a guy who's played here before, a guy that's played over 800 games. But it seems like, and we'll talk about the you know the defense stuff in, in a minute. It seems like that spot is truly up for grabs. And if last night was any indication, which it seems like it was, because Babcock and Julian both wanted to start their NHL lineups, Altonen is the guy right now. And is that is that from what you from what you've seen? Is is that what you deduce? There's nothing else to conclude. I mean, the one thing watching this is the third uh, training camp with Mike Babcock. This reminds me so much of Brooks like last year. I mean, because Brooks was kind of presumed to be on the team, but every day I'm going to practice and I'm writing down the lines and I'm like, he's on a line that isn't going to be on the team. He's on a line that isn't going to be on. Like, he was with players throughout camp and never using the role that suggested he was going to make the team. That's where Dominic Moore is. Like, literally, he's never been on a line where I'm like, that is going to make the team. Like, he's played with uh, Josh Levo. I mean, the thing is, he might make the team. It just doesn't suggest to me he's going to start in the healthy 12 to start the year. I mean, he might be the extra forward or the 14th forward, um, but it's it's a surprise. I mean, I, I didn't, I'm with you guys. I didn't expect at all that, that this would be a conversation, and now you're getting down to it. I don't, I'd be stunned if he is a fourth line center on opening night. Again, absent an injury in one of the remaining games, but it looks like he's gone. And then, so what do you, first of all, this raises two questions to me. First is Altonen is not your typical fourth line center under Mike Babcock. He doesn't win faceoffs. He's like 43% in the KHL. He's little, man. Like he looks light on his skates. Like mm-hmm. I, I know Steve's been pushing the weights around a lot, but like I feel like <laughs> I feel like if Dangle went up to him on the ice and just like leaned into him, he like he might fall over. If, if Dangle went him. up to him on dry land, maybe <laughs> yeah, on skates, I think he'd uh, he'd still. You know, there, but he's there, there, I mean, he'd have to though. skate into Steve to hit him for Steve to hit him. But. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's centrifugal force though. Like That's that, true. That one game at Rico. Uh, someone was coming up along the boards. I don't remember who it was, and Alton then just flies into him, and he doesn't have to completely nail him. It's just one stick touches the puck, the other is on the player. The player no longer has the puck. That's right. It. Like, but I, when I think Mike Babcock, fourth line center, I'm thinking like Luke Glendening, Byron Fraze, Ben Smith. I mean, guys who are underwhelming in most areas, but like not at the NHL level, but like they can win faceoffs, they can kill a penalty for you if you need. And Altonen is it not? He doesn't fit that mold, and Dominic Moore certainly does. So I wonder what it says about why Mike might be changing what he's doing, and that can go that can spin off in one conversation. And then I also wonder maybe Mike didn't really want to sign Dominic Moore because let's remember the management signs the players and the coaches play the players, yeah, and it, it, it might just suggest that he didn't really like the signing. He hasn't seen much, and he does not give a give a damn, eh? Well, and that's what management. Does. But that was the problem here for so many years: is that they played the guys that shouldn't have been playing. By who, way back, who, I mean, way back. We're talking, like you know, there were guys that were never given don't a go shot. Too far back, my well, memory's limited. Yeah, <laughs> like, this is man. I think of like, like remember when Dave Nonis was Leafs GM? Like that is a distant, far off fairy tale land. That well, maybe not fairy tale, but. 
I like I barely remember it. I barely remember it. It it seems like a like a traumatic thing that I've completely blocked remember, out. Remember when Michael Grabner uh, scored his first goal from his butt on the Leafs? Remember Man, when Michael like, Grabner was a Leaf? That, yeah, he that tweeted about it. Was he was like, a good natured guy. He, actually, he was. Yeah, Bernie's like great. I was like two when that happened. <laughs> but even like Horacek feels like forever. Ago. Who? Like. He who? <laughs> I don't know who you're talking about. I remember they used to have like this camouflage hoodie for player of the game, yep. and they gave it to Horacek after he won his first game, and he came and did his interview and like the camouflage hoodie. He was a good dude, but there was not a lot of success in that. No, period. there was not. <laughs> Is he anywhere in the league right now? I think he's a scout somewhere. I think he is. Boy. Uh, yeah. Poor guy. I oh. mean, that's a good thing about hockey. Usually people look after their friends, and people have a sort of – gray area jobs where they're getting paid and traveling around watching hockey still. Yeah. So. And that was not his fault. Let's be honest. I mean that Oh no, he was like a total fall guy. Yeah. 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 It was like he couldn't have done anything about that garbage end of the season. That was just the way it it's was. Like handing the Brooklyn Brawler the like heavyweight title and being like, all right, buddy, you're headlining WrestleMania. Do you know what he did though? <laughs> that it was the best. Like he <laughs> he he just chose to be the good teacher. So they, they played, I believe, one game here after he got hired. It was just after the calendar turn in January. And then it was straight to the California road trip, which is always oh. so weird. I've done a few of them with the Leafs. It's always a weird trip because you're far and it, it's just, I don't know. Usually they go there to lose 10 nothing every game. Cause it's always at a very strange point in the season, too. This year it's early. But that year, anyway, that year, the first practice is in L.A. at like 3 p.m. So, like, that is the ultimate go night, obviously, the night before for the players. And then afterwards, they bring in all these uh, In-N-Out burgers. So, like, at, like literally just a pile of In-N-Out burgers right after the players got off the ice. playing that night? No, the next day. Oh, the next day. Okay. But still, he comes yeah. in, gives them a favorable practice time. Like, this, it's, remember, the, the team is in crisis. Like, they've just fired their coach midseason while in a playoff spot. Like they're like the end is nigh, and Peter Horchak's like screw it. Late practice, in and out burgers. Let's get these guys playing, and they just they got smoked all three games on that trip. <laughs> oh, t- uh, bury that in my memory. And now Mike Babcock is coach. Yeah. So, just with keeping with the forwards, you, you said Chris that this might signal a change in what Mike Babcock wants to do. What do you mean by that? Well, we we already saw late last season, and then in preseason. He started having Nylander take the right side faceoffs and Matthews take the left side faceoffs. So I almost wonder, and it's really hard to put this to him. Like, if, like I will ask him this at some point, but this is the kind of question when there's still roster decisions. If you ask, he's going to bite your head off because he doesn't really want to give away too much of what he's thinking. His but, last scrum was very ornery. Yeah, I, I was on the. I took a couple of those. Yeah. Uh, like he like belt eye fastballs right back of my head. But <laughs> yeah, he wasn't. He wasn't having. It. That's Started okay. Out. That's it's all part of it. It's. It, no, no, no harm, no foul. But I wonder if he's got more confidence in the team's faceoff ability in general because he's found a way where on each line there's he's got more of an advantage by having a righty and a lefty take a strong side faceoff, and so maybe that's why he doesn't feel that he needs a fourth line center that can win you that draw because he's got more confidence in these guys. I mean, I'm just trying to think. I mean, it's it's a clear change in tactics. Like, literally in March, he started doing that with every faceoff, right and left side, and right through the playoffs, and they're doing it again. And now he, all of a sudden he doesn't just have a pure faceoff guy as fourth-line center. I mean, the fascinating part about Mike Babcock, and sadly he only shares just the littlest bit, is that he wants to be an innovator. And he's not a guy in any way that just, like, does it this way because it worked last year. And I would just love to know what's going on either in his head or behind the scenes because it, it, this just doesn't seem like a decision. I mean, granted, they, they probably didn't have a choice to have a skill guy as a fourth center in the past since he's been in Toronto, but this doesn't feel like something that would normally happen. And then I wonder what it says about Matt Martin, who is going to be on the team to start the year. But, you know, we know the clock could t- potentially be ticking there. Just Do with, you think so? Well... I mean, I think that's He's the biggest three- question with Leaf fans is with all this depth, how do you, it's not like last year it was one thing. The analytics community has their opinions about Matt Martin. They're well, well, well publicized. We know. But this year... He's legitimately taking the spot of somebody who is not just a little better, but probably far better. And is far the more role, skilled for sure. Probably more skilled. Sorry. Yes. And could bring more offensively to the table with what Matt brings, which is a very calming influence in the dressing room, puts the players in their happy place. And that can't be under, underestimated. Is that role long for this team? We played 82 games last year, and Babs did say the other day, he's on the team. Marty's on the team. So 
I, it's clear that he's going to start the year, I think, still playing every game. But I just wonder over time, I mean, he's got three years left on his deal. And he, it, so, like, yeah, so Casper Captain, he's going to the AHL. Yep. Probably the same for Sashnikov. Uh, Eric Fair probably is waived and, and down to the Marlies. Like, at some point, you're, you're like, maybe Jeremy Bracco, like, tears it up in the Marlies. And, and you have Captain in there. And they're going to have to try to create a space. I mean, another way to do that is to trade another forward. Mm-hmm. But at some point, I could see him being knocked from the lineup. It's just, we're not there yet. Okay. Um, but it, but I I don't know. If he plays all four years here and, and is a regular player the whole time, I will be surprised. And gets a ring. Well, he might get one of those just hanging out. Singularly? Oh, oh sorry. A couple of rings. Multiple yeah. rings. Many rings. Multiple rings. And They're going to have I'm... to sort out the D, though, still. Well, I wanted to yeah. get to that, too. Before, like, <laughs> let's I let's to do not forwards. go give him the cup just yet. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, wanted to, well, I want to do forwards and thing. then D. Yeah. I thought... Matt Martin's look very good, actually. I I don't crazy. disagree. I don't disagree at all. And listen, I I hated so asking that question because I hate to be one of those guys who comes across as I don't like him because I think he actually does play a, a valuable role. And I I know what it's like to be nineteen, and I have no idea what it's like to be nineteen with that much pressure. Not only are you playing in the NHL, you're playing for the Leafs. It's a different ball game, and to have a guy in there who's unaffected by that, who can pull you through that. Uh, even if you are more skilled than he is, you know, like a Mitch Marner might be or an Austin Matthews would be, and they're more skilled than most guys in the league, um, I feel like having a guy who, who can just go, it's going to be cool. Everything at 19 or 20 feels like it's up or it's really down. And I know that from all the relationships I was in at that point. <laughs> and I just, I'm glad that they do have guys like that in there because they do need them. And and if he takes that role and runs with it, fine. Well, and him... Martin and Kapanen, sorry, him, Boyle and Kapanen at the end of the year last year were pretty good. They were. So I'm sure seeing that, maybe they're thinking, hey, if we put a little bit more skill on that line with him, that it works better. And so maybe that's part of what goes into Alton Mm -hmm. as well, because Alton and Brown and Martin, there's there's some there's some actual guys who can score on that line too. And there was a um, there was a definite problem at four C last year. I mean, like Ben Smith just was not cutting it, and they I don't think they expected to do as well, but they he, couldn't rely on that line until Brian Boyle got to town. It was crazy. Right? Like it was a carousel. I think Holland played yes eight, Peter eight Holland. games. Probably six were at center. Byron Fraze got a couple in there. Goche played about twenty five. Smith was about thirty, and I think Boyle was another twenty five plus the playoffs. Like it was never consistent. And even Boyle, by the way. Who was supposed to be like the savior of that fourth line? He had three assists. Like that's all and he didn't had score. In that stretch <laughs> didn't score a single goal as a Leaf, although he set one up in the playoffs. That yeah, was pretty good. Sort of important that one. Yeah, and Matt Martin was a key part of that play. So I don't know. I don't know. Just a Crazy. thought. Anyway, I don't want to. I don't want to come across as a Matt Martin hater because I most definitely am not. Um, if you're Casper captain right now, though, and you're looking at the right side of this team, I mean, you're wondering where are your chances. You have to be. Marner, yeah. Nylander, Brown. I mean, I guess the fourth spot, if, you know, right now Komarov has been shifted to the right wing on that line with, with Marlowe and Kadri, and, and he's a free agent this year. So if he doesn't come back, maybe. Mm-hmm. JVR, do you flip to the he, left? Maybe he can play the left. I mean, it, it's got to be discouraging. I, I actually feel a little bit for the guy because most NHL teams, he's got a spot right now, and, and I don't see... Put it this way. Yesterday, Mike Babcock said he had a meeting with everyone on the bubble, and I went in the room and asked Kasperi if he had a meeting, and he said he didn't have one. So I, I don't even think he's legit on the bubble right now, just because of the waiver situation. It's not It's not because they're disappointed with him, but I just think they can't justify losing someone on waivers when they can just send him down for a little while. And I think, when does his contract end? At the end of this year? And he's an RFA, or is it at the end of two years? Because for a team that's going to have a tight cap situation for the foreseeable future, I'm not so bummed about him playing in the AHL. <laughs> you are heartless. <laughs> yeah, really, man. <laughs> hey, they're deep. You know they're that he... De- I, they, the Leafs have literally never been this Do you not care about this life. man's livelihood? Of course I He do. makes seventy grand when he's in the AHL, and he is making 925000 when he's in the NHL. His dad's Sammy Kapanen. Literally, the That'll difference cool. of his checks is like he it's, could pay off your mortgage if you. It is it's one check, yeah. one crazy. freaking check. <laughs> yeah, that always that always blew. And I'm saying that with tongue in cheek, but it's crazy the difference. Yeah. yeah oh yeah, like uh, I remember, like Ben Scrivens, for example, being with the Leafs. He was making sixty G's, gets called up. He's making six hundred. So, for as long as he was with the Leafs, even just practicing, I think it was like two weeks, three weeks, or something. 
He's making 10 times what he was making in the American League. <sighs> Plus, he's playing in the NHL. Do you know what's a fun game? So, NHL players get base, paid based on the length of the season. I actually don't know the exact number this year of days because it varies a little bit year to year, but it's somewhere around 185, mm-hmm. like ish. So, if you just like want to plug in like a five million dollar player, and you divide it by one eighty five, he's making twenty seven thousand dollars pre taxes a day. <laughs> oh, yeah. Or why wasn't I athletically gifted? Damn it! <laughs> or like you know, young Mister McDavid, and oh. this doesn't kick in till next year, but he'll be making like sixty eight grand a day. <laughs> Remember when Alex Rodriguez signed that first huge contract for 10 years with the Texas Rangers? They think they calculated that every was he was still playing shortstop like at that at point. Bat. Every at bat was 60 grand or something like that like and every annual salary. Every caught ball was $30,000. That's the one that stood out to me. Every time he caught a ground ball, 30 grand. Like that's just that's just crazy. Be really good at catching ground balls. Yeah, yeah, it's nuts. Anyway, I feel like I'm not bringing any structure. I'm just like bring, introducing all these random elements. Welcome to this. podcasting. Have you not listened <laughs> to the show? Or I've listened. You must structure. be new here. <laughs> yeah, no, I, and I'm the one who's like, you know, bringing up random. Like, you know, you were talking about something that was a really good point, and I was just bursting inside, going, "The Leaf shutdown line has actually three centers. Did you know that? Because Kadri and Marlow can play, and Komarov can play." And it's a useless point, and I just wanted to make it. And I saved it for this moment. For no good reason. It's not that useless, though. It kind of it kind of links in with what we were talking about, how having different guys take different face-offs. I thought so. <laughs> on topic. <laughs> Steve Dangle on topic. <laughs> um, qu- quickly, how do you think Patrick Marlowe has looked? Pretty good. Pretty good. He's skating well. And do you know what's hilarious? He is notoriously a slow starter. And let's not put too much stock in the preseason again, but he scored two goals. And I think that will do a lot for his, just his mind. I mean, he's a veteran, but mm-hmm. let's face it. If he didn't score for 10 or 12 games, the questions come. Yeah, of course. Clarkson all over again. Re- remember when, uh, when, just, when Matthews didn't score for 10 games and people were like, has he hit a wall? Is that it? He had two major droughts last year, and he scored 40. One of them was 13 games. Yeah. Yeah. I can't, the second one was a little less than that. Yeah, the first second one was like season. basically yeah. right after Ottawa, right? Right after right, the Right, but then he had four on opening night. So, like, if you <laughs> average it, it's pretty good. The, yeah, the, the four goals scored, in your first ten is pretty good. The right. goal he scored in the St. Pat's jersey, I think he had a seven-game pointless streak. Wow. And I only remember that because I saw the highlight recently. Well, clearly a bust. Oh, obviously. Like, cut him. Um, Does Marlo play out his entire contract with the Leafs? Probably not. I mean, it's just hard not to look at the way it's structured and have some doubt about that because, you know, I think this year and next year, fair. That's prior to Matthews and, and Marner's extensions kicking in. And then the next year, on July 1st, he gets paid $3 million signing bonus, and he's only owed $1.25 million the rest of the deal. So to me, that screams he, he gets paid that by the Leafs, and then the Leafs probably trade him somewhere or maybe retires. or I, I'm not sure. I don't know what mechanism will they'll find at this point. They'll cross that bridge when they get there, though. But it's certainly structured in a way that they can probably get out of the third year if they have to, and he still gets most of his money. I mean, he got a $7 million signing bonus. Talk about a payday. Mm -hmm. The day he signed that thing. And even when you've made the money he's made in his career, like $7 million right out of the gate. And I heard he bought a pretty nice pad here in Toronto. So I hope so. so <laughs> but think about that. Like again, even if you have money, not even those guys don't like have huge money laying around necessarily. It might right. be tied up in investments, all this other stuff. He got seven million bucks, like whoop boop, in the bank account. Seven million bucks. Man. Well, I, I don't know man. how the taxes work in, exactly. In GTA, but anyway, you could get like he get a know, condo for he, that. He might, nice yeah, he might be able to get one a one bedroom, bedroom condo. Nice house in Curtis. <laughs> <laughs> North Curtis. Um, okay, so yeah, Patrick anyway, Marlo, great. That's a big payday at his age, though. And, and you know, I think it'll be interesting with him this year. I mean, you've got thirty goal scorer Nazem Kadri. You've got the year before almost twenty goal scorer Leo Komarov. Nineteen goals, All Star team. And and yeah, nineteen goals and All Star team. Crazy. You you have a guy who can finish. You have a guy who's responsible. You have a guy who's been there. But what I like about this position for him is that he doesn't have to be the guy anymore, right? Huh. No, the the <laughs> like he's boom. not. He doesn't have to be. He's you know second or third line, whatever. However you you know you judge those lines, he's not the guy that they're relying on to score points every night like he was his entire career in San Jose. No, I mean really, you just have him. I mean, I doubt he'll kill penalties for the least, but he's done that. Mm-hmm. He's going to be on the power play. You just he's just another great piece. Yeah, I mean, look, I think that they would like to have got Joe Thornton too. 
like in a perfect world, they wanted both of them. But they felt like they had this window to 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 spend a little bit more maybe than market value to to add him. And as long as he's healthy, I mean, he can definitely skate. Like the Leafs again will be one of the fastest, if not the fastest teams in the league. I mean, especially if Callie Rosen makes a team on the defense, which it looks like he will. Like, that he guy flies. skates like the wind, too. Yeah. So then you're going to have Gardner, Riley, and Rosen on three different pairings, all guys that skate well. Carrick's pretty mobile. And you have four lines with some speed, especially if Captain never gets up there and plays on the, the fourth line. I mean, anyway, they, they've there's a lot to... This team could be it could be Harlem Globe Trotter, <laughs> depending so. on the circumstances. But like honestly, like it, they could be winning games seven five and stuff. I mean, I'm sure Babcock doesn't want that, but it's kind of how they're built. So Why couldn't they get Joe? Ah, uh, Joe loves San Jose. Okay, fair enough. I mean, he did eight million dollars. Joe loves eight million dollars. <laughs> eight million dollars wasn't bad. I think he loves San Jose though too, like the lifestyle and everything. I mean, mm-hmm. it's a big. Big change. It's a big change. I mean, he's got kids. I mean, Patrick Marlowe to uproot four kids, all born in the U.S. His wife, who I believe is American. It's, it's, I'm not saying it's bad, but at his age, he didn't have to do that, right? Right. Like, he could have got a decent contract in San Jose, gone out as a lifelong shark. He's played 1,493 regular season games as a shark. Wow. Like, it's hard at that point to move. I mean, it's a little oh bit like his... Oh, my God. Since getting traded by Boston? Sorry. No, no I mean uh, Marlo. Marlo. Oh, oh, oh. Sorry. <laughs> I, I was doing so well. <laughs> I screwed up so early on the last show, and I was... Go ahead. It's all right. But still, most guys, and granted, we talked about the payday. He wasn't going to get paid what he'd get paid, but he probably doesn't need money either. So I'm just saying. $7 million. That's, that would be enough for me. I'd be like, okay, see you, San Jose. Great times. <laughs> right. But he was made, what, 80? Yeah. I, have, I actually don't know how much he's made, but he's made a lot. Yeah, yeah. I know. It makes sense. So it's, he, just, it's just not everybody's down with that and their life situation at that age. So it would have been interesting. I mean, Tyler Bozak would really be on the clock. If mm-hmm. they had a guy, Joe Thornton. Probably would have traded him. I, I would think. Imagine. Like, couldn't afford him. Well, and you, even if you could, you don't really want him as your fourth line center. I mean, at some point, it's diminishing returns. Yeah, right. 4.25. <laughs> That's a no, very expensive fourth line yeah. center. Um, so, moving on to defense, do so you think Callie Rosen's a Maple Leaf at the start of the season? I do. But I saw that the pairings did change today. So What, are they, what were they today? Uh, Marintz and Carrick, I saw. Oh. They, the return of Martin Marinch. Oh man, everybody's excited about that. Man, I just watched back the first game of last season and I blocked out of my mind that he started with Riley last year. Morgan right. Riley's had a lot of NHL defense partners, yeah. given how little time relatively he's been in the league. Um so but I do think that Rosen has a good shot at it. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's played four years in Sweden. He skates well, does it right every day. <laughs> he's a good man. A good player as well as good man. Um, do you see then? Sorry, hit- I'm not making fun of the Babs. It's just no, like you actually start to. <laughs> he's like, a caricature. If yeah. If you spend as much time around him as he I knows. do, he you, knows. you just you hear it in your mind, like his descriptions of him. Yeah. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I think he's. I think he's on the team. Connor Carrick. Yes. Okay. I'd be stunned. I mean, yeah, he's great. No, look at right D is still a problem. Ron Hainsey, left shot on the right side. I'm not sure that this is going to work. I mean, I'm, you can't say First it's not. Part. But, I mean, I know it worked. They made it work in Pittsburgh when Latang was out. And that's some of the logic, you know, I'm sure what the Leafs saw there in signing him. But he's, he's, he's not young. I don't know. I got some concerns because if that goes awry, you know, Zaitsev Gardner was pretty good last year down the stretch. I, you, th- this team needs right shot Ds. And so I just don't see them risking losing Carrick on waivers or something like that. And, uh, I still think there's a lot there. He's, he's a young, still pretty young player. He had a monster AHL playoffs a couple years ago. Mm-hmm. The, I still like a lot. I know it was a tough end of the year for him, but I just don't think they're ready to, to pass on him just yet. And in terms of the American League, like the right-handed options are pretty limited too. I think they got Justin Hall and the new guy, Laverde? I think meant Lilgren. Oh! <laughs> yeah, he's, he's well, a guy. When he's ready. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So uh, that could be a while, though. Let's maybe move on to him. Is he going to be a Marley or what? He, he's going to be a Marley. He's going to be a Marley. All right. I uh, I phoned his GM in the Swedish league like two weeks ago, and I didn't know anything about the guy. I just found out he was a GM and contacted him. And then I call him and I'm like, yeah, what do you think the Leafs are going to do? Like, is he going to stay? And he's like, I've known Lou for 30 years. He was my GM in New Jersey in the 80s. 
And like this guy, Anders Carlson was his name. He's played like a hundred games with, with the Devils, even before my memory. So like a long time ago, and he's known Lou for thirty years. He's like, yeah, Lou called me. He said, yeah, we're probably gonna keep him. So oh. I think. I mean, that doesn't mean it's done. If they don't like, if if they think he's not gonna benefit from it now that the Leafs have seen him, you know, in some games against NHL players, it could have changed. But I suspect they'll they'll opt to keep him down the street, where they can really monitor his development monitor what he eats, how he trains, just his ice time, his mm-hmm. usage, all that stuff. I mean, it's, t- it's tough for a team to give that up. Because you have to remember, the Swedish League, they have promotion and, and demotion, like they do in English soccer, say. And so, like, if you get on a team that isn't doing that great, you know, he might not play. And, and the Leafs would have no say in that. I mean, that team's maybe fighting for a playoff spot or to stay yeah. in the top league. Or, you know, there's all kinds of circumstances, and he's still a young player over there. Um, so I think that there's a lot of benefit. You can only t- keep your first round picks from Sweden. So Carl Grundstrom, for example, can't play for the Marlies because he was a second round draft pick. What a silly rule! Well, well it's to keep the stars in Sweden, right? They're, they're protecting. Because it's funny. I also talked to the GM of his team, of Grundstrom's team, uh, for Lunda, and he's like, "We think we can win a championship, especially with Carl. Like they are counting on Grundstrom, especially with Carl. Like they, but he's only 19 years old. You know, he was drafted in 2016, but." He's an impact player for them. So they're counting on him coming back. And the rules say uh, before age 21, unless you're in the NHL or you're a first-round pick, you can't play in the AHL. But that seems, I don't know, just based on what you said, that seems like a situation where he'll play a big role rather than get buried. A big role on a good team, too. There you go. Mm-hmm. Man, and he looks like, to me, a guy who's going to be in the NHL sooner than later, to be honest, Grunstrom. He's, uh, he's like the new Komarov. Uh, he, he he doesn't find a hit. He's not going to finish, <laughs> and he's just he's just kind of a bulldog. You know, he's not he's certainly not spectacularly gifted. Uh, he, I don't think he'll be competing for one of the scoring spots. But uh, to me, he's another player to, to keep an eye on. You know, for next season and beyond. Do you think that with with Leo's contract coming up, they're looking at him going? Well, there's an easier, cheaper replacement that's younger. Probably. I mean, because and and with no disrespect to Leo Comrade, no, who I, I love. think everybody loves Leo. I mean, he's probably the most popular guy in the dressing room just just straight goofy and and speaks every language that anyone else could speak in there he's just he's an awesome guy and and you know he's been he's been here through the tough years and i know he's done a really good job even with nylander and captain when they first came over would, would come and hang out at his house a lot uh, sashnikov stayed with him when he first came over from russia and he speaks russian i mean there's there's a lot of value he's like the united nations of the leaves Leo. <laughs> but you know, I'm not saying for sure he's done beyond the season. Maybe he'll come back on a cheap deal that that they like as well. But there there are replacements coming. I mean, I think that's the reality. If even if you're James Van Riemsdyk, who's coming off his best season offensively, and even though he might have another great season, they they might want to move on just because. You they can't. You can't keep all the oil under the ground. I mean, it's like bubbling up at this point. Well, and and I wonder that with Bozak as well. Like, is is you know, let's say Freddie Goche steps in or they Adam don't have Brooks as much steps at in. center though. They don't. They don't. And I, and if Bozak does come back on a deal that's similar to the one that he has, is that that bad? Probably not. But I don't know if they'll do that. Okay. But that one, I like. Or do they do they slot Nylander in at center and split up the Matthews Nylander thing next year? Maybe not. I mean, like, you, why would you do that? Right. Right. They have options. But you kind of have to decide who you want Marner to play with then, because we're talking about potentially his two line mates not being here because they're both free agents. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you know, the team's going to look pretty different. I, I I would suggest to you when we do this podcast a year from now, and we're talking with the lines, like it's going to be quite different. I would think just because there's going to be that, that there has to be change there. It's going to be force change. I don't think they're going to just sign everybody. Three right. pretty important UFAs. Yeah, absolutely. And core member. I mean, we're talking, these guys with Kessel were a line, right? Yeah. Like, they were the top wow. line for years. And, and yeah. like they've been around in sports terms, like, forever. I mean, Bozak's the longest served guy on the team. When he leaves, I was just thinking it will complete a generation of Leafs as me as a journalist. Because I remember the wow. day they introduced him. Uh, they had a press conference because they signed him as a college free agent in March. And I, I, he was there, and I remember that day, and I'm like, oh, my God. He's now the oldest guy on the team, or, or longest tenured, rather. And then when he's gone, I will have covered every Leaf from him. It's like hundreds of Leafs. So present. Wow. And yeah, there have been. There have been a ton. What was it? it was a couple years ago, was 70 players they used or something like that? It was like crazy. 50-something? Uh, 50. 50, 50, 50 like, or? Valley have played 10 games with the Leafs. Wow. Like, who even remembers that? And how far down the depth chart is he? Um, 
with with regards to because I you know Rosen obviously back to the defense has been great, but so has Borkman. It seems anyway. And Dermot. Uh, and Dermot. And and I'm surprised. Borgman that... nearly killed Kapanen in practice yesterday. Oh really? <laughs> like, he's a, he he's a heavy hitter. Him. He didn't mean to. Like it was. Sorry, it, it just happened. But he's a big man. Like he looks like a he looks like a fighter or something. Like he's jacked. He's he, the hit that he threw on Friday night was audible around the whole arena. And I forget who it was against. Evan but was Rodriguez a, was it? Yeah, and he went right off the ice. Right, right? he was gone. Gone from the game, at least for a little bit. Um, and then he, he threw a big hit on Mike Blunden in the first game and had to fight. First fight of his whole career. Right. He said, because right. in Sweden, if you throw your gloves down, you're automatically suspended three games. So oh. so it, like, never happens. I mean, it something really bad has to happen where someone's willing to do that. So he's never actually fought. But, again, judging by him, um, I'm not concerned about him in... In the martial, the dark arts or whatever <laughs> of, of hockey, <laughs> you know, I think he can handle himself if if it comes to that. Now, do you think? Wh- what do you think of his skill set? What do you think he brings? I and, haven't and, seen enough yet. I mean, he's a rookie of the year last week, in, last year in the Swedish Hockey League. I mean, and he played for the championship team, HV seventy one. So, this is a good signing. I mean, the more I've thought about this, I think this is going to be the avenue the Leafs go. And you sort of hinted at this earlier, Steve, but. When you sign these guys that are 21, 22, 23 from Europe, they, they get signed to entry-level contracts. So you haven't had to worry about developing them because they've already been playing pro, uh, so it's different than getting a draft pick. But they're on entry-level deals for up to age 25, so up to two or three years, depending on their age when they sign it. So that gives you two or three years, first of all, where you hope they're developed, but you can send them back and forth to the Marlies without losing them as assets. I mean, and plus, the Leafs just have the money to do this and, and to, the resources to go scout like crazy and to, to woo these guys. And I think it's a little bit of a market inefficiency. I, I haven't looked around. This is a, I'm burning a story idea for, for down the road by, by talking about it here. I hope none of my competitors listen to the Steve Dangle podcast. <laughs> but, I mean, I just think the Leafs have... I think you're good. The, <laughs> You'll be all right, But yeah. the Leafs have found something here, even by signing Soshnikov, which happened before uh, Lamorello was around, uh, Altonen, Borgman, uh, Callie Rosen. It makes a lot of sense, because now you have guys you can move up and down that are a little bit older and a little bit further along uh, than your prospects. And all those guys... Well, not all of them, but uh, Rosen, Borgman, and Altonen for sure. If they hit all their performance bonuses, 1.775. That's right. it. That's it. And if they hit all their bonuses, great. Right. You well, know? most guys in that situation don't get bonuses. So that's the other beauty because it's really only your Austin Matthews. I mean, you could pick yeah. first overall. Like Dermot doesn't have any bonuses, right? No. None. Pretty sure. Uh, signing, I think that's Sign. it. No okay. Yeah, but signing... Is it only? I mean, it's nice for him because it means he literally gets ninety two thousand five hundred the day he signs. But Woo-hoo! but it, it doesn't take it doesn't add on. It just takes away from that nine twenty five, right? Oh, oh, okay. So most guys get a signing bonus because it's a nice gesture to a young guy who hasn't made money, right? Because the Canadian hockey here's some money to get you players. started. Yeah. So unless you've got a side deal or you're getting something greasy, a lot of these guys, their parents have paid a ton of money for them and they haven't made any money yet. Oh. But then if you win. You know, if you score forty goals as a rookie, you you promptly make two and a half million in in bonuses. So, I mean, it can come quickly if you're good. I remember uh, it would have been summer two thousand nine. I got to talk to Jesse Blacker and Nazem Kadri. Blacker used to be a second round pick of the Leafs, and uh, you know, in between takes or whatever, while the camera was off, Blacker just kind of goes to Kadri, goes signing bonus. And Kadri's just like, <laughs> like, like yeah. smile on his face. he was. He was happy. Ninth overall pick or whatever he was. Yeah. Probably a good signing bonus. Yeah. Um, yeah. He was happy. So how, how do you think Lilligren's looked? Uh, it, up and down. Up and down. And not, and like not, an 18-year-old? Not he looks like away. He looks like an 18-year-old. But I, I almost think it's irrelevant in a sense because I didn't believe for a second he had a chance to make the team. And... We should have talked to you months ago. <laughs> yeah. I was hoping you would, when but we yeah. Like, wow. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, but I think the Leafs didn't expect that. He, okay, here's some perspective. I've been covering the NHL draft for 10 or 12 years or whatever it is. Literally every first overall pick tonight they're drafted, or sorry, first round pick, you know, because there's usually one per team. So, like, like the Flames, all the Calgary media is there, right? doesn't matter if it's the 18th pick or the second. And, you know, do you think you're ready for the NHL? And, like, every kid I've ever heard for 10 years, yeah, I'm I'm going there to make it this year. I think I can do it. Timothy Lilligren said, I think I need another year in Sweden. And, obviously, that was before the plan was hatched where he's probably going to stay in North America. But I've never heard a first-round pick 
say that. I mean, I think a lot of them probably know it in the back of their minds, but mm-hmm. they feel like they can't be that honest or whatever. I think he he's been realistic. I mean, that it was no small thing. The the mono, you know, he missed two months where he didn't skate, let alone didn't get like stronger or whatever. Like he 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 was not skating in his draft year, and he's still only eighteen. So let's remember, if he's only been skating since he was thirteen, he's missed like if you start doing the math, he's missed like a significant portion of development time for how young a man he is. So. Uh, maybe not even a man yet. So I, it's, it's going to take a little time. But if he's ready by next year, we're not, you know. He could tear. I mean, he it could. It might be three years, though. Like, who knows? Yeah, honestly. And, and so be it. So he right? was, once upon a time, earlier in the year, he was supposed to be, like, a top five pick. And, like, he was I, – I didn't really see this on the broadcast, but uh, every couple of years there's a player that the camera always focuses on after every single pick. It's a, ooh, he hasn't picked yet. Once upon a time, it was Alexei Cherepanov, and then it was Cam Fowler was a really bad one because he was supposed to go, like, third, and it's, like, Angelo ninth, Esposito tenth. back in the day. Oh, he oh, fell to, wow. like, 20th, something like that. Um, he played on, like, four world junior teams or something. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was nuts and played well, too. Was there any sense that maybe that affected Lilligren a bit, falling all the way to seventeen? There, I have a sense of that. You know, he says that... As soon as it all happened, mentally, he was just like, screw this. I'm not going to worry about the draft. I mean, I can't control this. But realistically, I was 18 once. Obviously, I wasn't an elite athlete like he is. But I, I No. Oh. No. Sadly. <laughs> Played some badminton in high school. A <laughs> little, little bit of hockey. That was about it. But More than me, golf. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, but, you know, let's face it. You're going to you – you would worry. I mean – yeah, Think you about would. it. If, if if something that's affecting like such a major thing, it'd be like if something went wrong and you really want to get into a certain university and something was impacting your one of your grades was slipping or something. You'd be anxious about whether that's going to happen. So, I, I don't see how it couldn't have affected him. And to me, it's great that he can be here and be with the team and, and be like a Marley and be around. And who knows? Like if three injuries happen maybe he gets to play a game or two like you never like I just think it's not a bad thing for him to get used to living in Toronto uh, he's had an interesting story you know he, he was raised essentially without his dad and his mom had to do a lot for him as you would imagine as a single parent and had to move uh, to a different city when he was younger I mean he's he's had he's had a, an interesting sort of path to this and, and you know I think the Leafs are really going to look after him and that there's a lot of benefit to giving him this year and not putting pressure on him so yeah absolutely um so yeah he hasn't looked great is the easy answer to say I, I don't think he's been horrible he's bad in the one rookie game there's a rookie game i went to the first one Montreal, right? yeah, yeah and, and he just he looked lost he hasn't been that bad when he when he played the one exhibition game but you know i, th- I think everyone's realistic about his development curve and he needs some time dermot he's knocking he's knocking he's knocking i i i think the perfect thing to do is to play dermot on the left with Lilgren and the marley's and, and see <laughs> and see if they can maybe get something going there because down the road maybe there's a fit and you know i it's you know travis wouldn't want to hear that travis you know travis wants, he wants to, to make it of course well and look i know the marley's guys like the guys that are on that team think he can play in the nhl like now and and i don't dispute that he can but rosen's a little bit older and here's the other thing. Like, we're all going to go nuts with what the lineup is next Wednesday in Winnipeg. Like, five games into the season last It'll year, it'll change. Milan Mahalik got sent down. Yeah. And, yeah. and I could see that happening again. That, that scored a goal. Mm-hmm. You know, Babcock said essentially you get the first 20 games to, to tinker. So, even based on what the lineup is out of camp, we're not going to know until mid November, late November, probably what this, this team looks like. So, even if Travis starts with the Marlies, which he can without waivers again, um, you know, maybe. Maybe he gets uh, a few games there and then comes up later in October. And maybe, yeah, and, and maybe have some fun with Lilligren too. And, you know, those two can tear it up together, right? It's kind of like Nylander and Matthews now, honestly. Like this year, I hope those guys are keeping a diary. And I know no one's keeping a diary anymore. Yeah. But this is like, no matter what happens next in their lives, and they both look like they're going to have wildly successful careers, like these couple years, last season and this season to come, are going to be like the best years of their life. I mean... I hate to say that. I don't mean that they can't have happiness in the future, but it's more that this is so unique when you find yourself with in this environment with other young people that are also just amazing. You're going through it together. They're having fun. They like each other. They're buying crazy clothes. They're making lots of money. They're becoming stars. Like, it must <laughs> Purple be. Purple suits. Yeah, they're be, amazing. Honestly. 
and look, they've worked really hard to get there. And like, I, I just think it's such a cool thing that they get to do it together. Because I think there's a lot less pressure in a sense than maybe we think because the, it's really shared by a couple guys on that team. I mean, look, Austin, Austin is the main cog, but he's got a lot. He's got a lot of people sharing in the weight. Even guys like Morgan Riley who aren't that old, but you know, I notice he's wearing an A now. Looks like permanently, and there's the, it's getting spread around pretty well. Even Freddie Anderson, who's a little older yet still, but it, it, I don't think he's not like one savior. It's not like getting Nathan McKinnon in the draft. And I guess they had Landis Cog and Duchesne. But, like, it's not just getting one guy and going, he has to change everything. I mean, this is all happening together. And that's that's what makes what the Leafs have, like, the potential of it so great. I could ask you about the Leafs all day. <laughs> I guess we can talk well, about we, we got to keep talking. We, so I'm on. going to. Yeah, um, I keep going. <laughs> it was going to be we the next thing we got to talk say. about, but we had to talk about this stuff. Yeah, there was some confusing... Uh, Babcock said something about Anderson that confused me a little bit. Ooh. Um, and little basically intrigue? it was... <laughs> well, he came to camp, uh, what was it, prepared or healthy or something this year? But he wasn't referring to the injury at all. It didn't seem that he suffered oh, last year. Oh, you mean that he, like, he, oh, he's in shape He's this in year. shape. There you go. Thank you. Is Sorry. Quote, I yeah, forgot the said, actual words. Yeah, he's in shape this year. What does he mean? <laughs> well, he's skinnier, man. Yeah? Because I saw last year. Kadri. Yeah, Kadri, Kad- too, eh? Kadri lost like, some weight, didn't he? Noticeably. Really? I mean, in the summer... When I was just like looking at Instagram, I was like, "Whoa!" He posted a couple of pictures. I mean, he wasn't fat, but it's just like by from where he was. I think he keep, this is the other thing. There's all this competition now. Like mm-hmm. no one, even when you're Nazem Kadri, even with his contract, even as good as he played last year, I think everyone wants to be part of this, right? And and the coach has been pretty clear that everyone's got to still shape up a bit. And it, I mean, I we're a little. I don't like going here because every player ever around the league best shape of my life. Of course. But definitely, Kadri is noticeably slimmer, as is Anderson. Okay. Now, last year I saw Anderson weighed 230. Well, he's a big boy. I mean... Like, not fat. Yeah, but most goalies... Six, what? Most goalies these days are like bone racks, though. Like, they're... Sh- goalies are shaped weird, right? Yeah. They're a little... They're <laughs> gangly, man. Like, it's... But that's why they're goalies. Like, they're literally skinny, long-limbed, with giant eyes. <laughs> um... Uh, speaking of, you know, like just so we we, we got two guys that are, are interesting to me, Polak and Marincin. So is Marincin making this team or not? Which one of them is your whipping boy, or is it both? Neither, neither. I don't want to make Polak. A wh- we we gave him too much hell, and I think he played well at the end of last season, yeah. given the role he was put in. Uh, sucks that he had the knee injury, but you've got a slow guy who's now potentially slower. Yes. I don't know what's going to happen there. You know, he said the other day, we, we had a chance to chat. He's he's one of the, he's like a real character, really funny guy. But he said there's going to be pain all year. So I really think the only question here is his health and where the Leafs feel he's at. If if they think he can play, he's getting a contract as the extra D or, again, might even be the number eight. He might be the number eight who's really the number nine, meaning that when trouble comes, they're bringing someone up and they're, they're playing instead. I, I'm not sure. But... You know, I think that they, they, they'll they probably keep him around if he's healthy. I, but I don't know if he's healthy. We haven't seen him play in a preseason game. He sat out the very first scrimmage at camp. Like, I got the impression, and this guy's a tough guy, but that he's he's struggling a little bit. And Marincin? He's in trouble. I, like, I think it's possible they put him on waivers. What do you think they put? What's the, what's the Leafs' defensive lineup look like next week? Well, you're going to have Hainsey and Riley for at least the first game. Mm-hmm. Because I'm not convinced that's going to work long term. <laughs> Zaitsev and Ryan, uh, Zaitsev and Gardner, mm-hmm. and then I think it's going to be Carrick and Rosen, and then seven. Se- see, that's just the thing. Seven is probably Marincin if I think about it, because it doesn't make sense to keep Dermot or Borgman Up. for that yeah, spot. For sure. I mean, you'd rather have them playing. That's so, a pretty deep Marley's defense, by the way. You think about that: Dermot, Lilligren, Borgman, and then Hole too. Hole, yeah, who's played Hull, really well. Borgman, Hole. I know N- Nielsen, Loverdi. Like, Valio's not even in that lineup. And you have and, Nielsen, and Nielsen on a third pair or a second pair? I'd Potentially. Pro- probably put him underneath Borgman by midseason. That's crazy. Probably. And I think, you know, he has the potential to be a player if he shores some things up. Right. So. right. Um, you also, Marlies are looking crazy. Yeah, well, they're, they're going to be fun. You know, the more I think about this, maybe this will impact what they do with Lilligren then. Maybe if they're worried 
that they don't have the spot. Oh, they'll make. I think they make time for him. Yeah, I think so too. That's the guy. You're like, okay, Renat Valiev. Sorry, but uh, we're gonna. You have a word with Sheldon Keefe. Yeah. Yeah, Timothy Lilligren, you give him the ice time. I just don't think I don't see any reason why for the reasons you you said before, Chris, and I've been on this train for a month and a half. Why would you have him go back and you can't monitor him with a team that you know was in disarray last year, uh, where you could have him in the Marlies, pretty stable team, deep team. He's not going to be expected to do too much with guys that have been there before and that are a little bit older, so you can shelter his minutes a bit. You know, maybe you don't put him on the first pairing, but. He's a guy. He's a right-handed defenseman that you believe in. You may, you can make time, right? You can man, manage his minutes, manage his his expectations, and manage his diet and video coaching and all the other things that the Marlies have that no other AHL team and many European teams don't have. Well, and he can come down the street and just be around the Leafs every once in a while. Yeah, and sit down with the coach, watch practice. Practice in the same building. You know, last year it's funny. Last year I remember there was a practice and Jeremy Bracco showed up. And he, cool. and he told me after, he's like, they just invited him in and kind of had him around when they had a meeting just to get him a feel for it and see the facilities a little bit. And I mean, I think there's value in all that because then when you get there for real, it's just you're comfortable. Yeah. Right. And this isn't new. Yeah. You know, I just, I, I think that there's, there's really something to be said for that. And it was a brilliant idea. It's probably 10 years ago now to move the team back from St. St. John's because, you know, it's a disadvantage just for same day call ups, but also some of that underrated stuff where you can use Barb Underhill or, or you know, Daryl Belfry, you know, some of the skills coaching, skating coaching they have. I just think there's a lot more crossover in what they do with basically being in the pad next to each other out in Etobicoke. Um, you saw Montreal last night. Both of you. I'd like to know what you saw from Montreal last night. Remembering that it is preseason, so all the Habs fans listening, don't jump down our necks here. Yeah. But I, I have personally thought that their, four, their team seems just incomplete. Like, it seems like there's holes in that team that they meant to have filled that they weren't able to. I 100% agree, but I don't think last night was the perfect game to show that. They hit, I think, three crossbars, three posts. Mm-hmm. They they beat Freddie on all, on all of those. He tried to stop it, couldn't, you know, didn't go in the net. So it's not a shot on goal if it hits the post, which I think is a little silly. Um, but, like, they're they're inches away. They're so close. So last night might have been the best they've looked offensively <laughs> all preseason, and they only got one goal. Chris? It's going to be an interesting season, man. <laughs> they've, scored, they've scored seven goals in five preseason games. Like, Please look oof. at Chris's face on the video when, you, when you're well, listening to this. Please go to this part of the video just to see But Chris's I'm not face. laughing at them. I'm just thinking of how much time I spent in that city and how it really gets even crazier than Toronto about stuff. Sure around a team and the concern for this team was that they couldn't score and it's not just that they're 0-5 at this point they haven't scored and so as Steve says yes they hit the post and stuff so maybe it is going to come and, and everything will go away but you know they're they're going to want to take advantage of a weak Leafs lineup in Quebec City on Wednesday how have they not signed Yermer Yager scoring's an issue well maybe speed's an issue either. there speed's an yeah. issue okay or you know, I was surprised they didn't go after a, like a Thomas Vanek or something like that. You know, that kid, that's all he can do. Well, but at least he gives you that. They've been there though. Yes, with, they with have. Thomas that's true. Vanek they got him before. Um, as a Leafs fan, I have seen many a perfect storm. This seems like the perfect storm for unhappiness in Montreal because you got a guy like Jonathan Drouin, who I think is fantastic, and I think he's going to do a good job. But he's going to be basically burdened with carrying the whole load for this team. Him and Pacioretty, for sure. Him and Pacioretty. Yeah. Well, and Pacioretty already gets dumped on. You know, the guy always scores 30 goals, money in the bank, pretty much, and he still gets dumped on. I just feel like no matter how much he scores, if the team overall has trouble scoring, it's going to come back to him. Well, on the blue line, there's some issues there. I mean, this Victor Mete, I hope I'm saying that right. I think uh, so. Mete, I think Mete. they called him yesterday. Yes. Yeah. It's, I mean, he's been their most exciting guy in camp. Out of nowhere, this yeah. guy looks like he can make the team, but... Their blue line is questionable, much like the Leafs, granted. But, like, they don't have a regular partner for Shea Weber at this point. Schlem- and it might Schlemko's be a guy on the Knights. Injured, <laughs> and it might be a 19-year-old kid from the London Knights who's buddies with Mitch Marner. Wow. Um, which, you know, maybe that'll work out. I mean, it's not – he might be a September sweetheart. Like, it's hard to know. Like, there's always these guys – I saw Killer Yamamoto, first-round pick of the Oilers, has five goals in preseason. He's probably not playing in the NHL this year, at least for any length of time. But – you know, and I don't want to diminish what those guys are doing, but there's a different. I don't think the league's trying fully yet. Right. Um, 
but there, there's this is man like Montreal has. I mean, they're they're doubling down on everything, right? They're not rebuilding. Like they're trying to win with this core. They just paid Carey Price a lot of money, which I think he's worth. But it's it's a gamble. It's eight years extension. I mean, I, I get why they did it, but you're not leaving a window to get crappy in there. <laughs> You know, yeah. I don't think they want to. I think they've honestly had this internal look. We all know they need a center, and they're they're hoping John and Duran could be a center in the NHL. They're they're done with the Galchenyuk thing for now. And, but how do you get a center? You, you win the lottery, and they nearly won the Austin Matthews lottery. Oh, <laughs> I know, I know. I think uh, I think you were the I, first one to write about that. Oh my! Well, dear someone God. that works in Montreal told me about it, so it wasn't that I even realized. Like my point is, it's in their minds. The Leafs nearly won the Connor McDavid lottery. Yep. Yeah. The, I mean, yeah. The way the Leafs were one lottery ball away from winning McDavid, the Habs were one lottery ball away from winning Matthews. Right. I mean, well, you could do this to death. <gasps> yeah. I mean, even and I don't know how good Nico Heischer is going to be. Although he's looked great in preseason. Yeah, he has. He has. But like that was the weirdest lottery ever in terms of the. It was like the fifth, eighth, and thirteenth teams of odds ended up one, two, three, or whatever it was. It so was the first lottery that was actually like chaotic. It was a true lottery. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't just hand, so. This you, you like we could go back through any since they've instituted the draft lottery. I believe. Do you remember the Patrick Steffen? A play where he had the empty net and he hit the post. Yes, yes. and then they come back and score. <laughs> oh my right? god! Now I believe I should have fact checked this that that made Edmonton get an extra point and they would have won Patrick Kane. <gasps> that that point made the difference of them getting Patrick Kane. So you could always <laughs> do stuff like this. <laughs> I yes, I think you're right. Wow. My I point is right. you could always do stuff like that. I mean, oh. it's it's such a crazy game, and, and when you introduce lotteries and weird things, but. I mean, imagine McDavid. Now, imagine this, since I don't know why we're down the rabbit hole here. Imagine, <laughs> imagine McDavid became a Leaf, but then Matthews became a, a Hab the next year. Utter chaos. 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 Anarchy. Anarchy. Because I'll say, I definitely, like, I have, I have McDavid as the number one of this young group, but I, I think Matthews might be a little bit closer than, than he's getting credit for at this point. And that I closer could, to McDavid. Yes. I think that I could see those two. Dueling? Le- legit being the top two players in the league in a couple of years' time. And and sort of like unquestionably. What about um, Jack Eichel? Where does he factor? Number three? Yes. He, he's very good. I mean, he was... He is. He's after amazing. coming back from that injury last year, he was nearly a point a game. I'm not really a big fantasy hockey guy, but I'm grabbing Jack Eichel. Yes. A I'm career not, high of 24 goals, I, I, he's going to beat that. <laughs> I'm not down on Jack Eichel by any stretch. I just, I'm actually more saying that I think because Austin Matthews didn't arrive with the same hype level as... The you know the Crosby's and McDavid's, you know because he was kind of an unknown from a weird place and he not a weird an unusual place for hockey. And then he played in Switzerland. No one really saw him play. He got hyped up. But it wasn't the same degree. I think we're only just understanding how good he is. I mean, he was second in the league as a teenager in five on five shots. Like he is a monster. Like you watch him on the ice, he gets the puck from everywhere. He just he's like it's crazy how much he controls the play, and he's got a shot. He's got all the physical tools. Did he get knocked over, like, what, more than two or three times last year? By no, a hit? he's strong. Jake Dotchin hit him once. I think he got hit <sighs> by someone on Detroit in the outdoor game. Of course, Jake uh, freaking Dotchin hit got, him, too, man. Oh, leaf killer. He wasn't even hit hard. I think he got, but like, he got, knocked over by Chara in the second game, and it made all the highlight reels. Right. But it's just, I mean, and obviously he got hit a little bit more than that, but, like, no. he, man, like, I, he doesn't obviously have the speed. No one does of McDavid. And I think McDavid is is likely to win a whole bunch of scoring titles. But don't be surprised if Matthews is is a little closer to him than I think we all think right now. I mean, even people look at last year and they look at 100 points and 69 points. It looks like it's a huge gap. I'll be uh, I bet it'll be much narrower than that when the the totals are done this season. Um, who else around the league? Sorry, I'm not trying to get you excited. I just no, no, no yeah, no. no I really like I really believe this. Like I'm not just trying to like stir up some hype train sure. or something. I. I I think that the hockey world doesn't totally yet realize how good this guy is. Uh, who else around the league fascinates you? Players, teams? Who, who are you going to be following this year in terms of intrigue? What Tampa are... fascinates me. Yeah. Because they're amazing, right? They should be. I, they sh- I think they should have won the Cup last year. Didn't even I called it. I, I was like, Tampa-Nashville is what I thought. Yeah. One half right. But it might still happen. Like That's the, that cra- that's, still happen. That's the funny part, right? 
Yeah. You get a Tampa Toronto series with the way the divisional Ooh. playoffs work. <laughs> in That'd the be first amazing. round. <laughs> oh, imagine be so that. Good. And it would be all Canadians at the Tampa game too. Not not that there's not Lightning fans. There are, but there's so many Canadians down in that area. I just think it'd actually be kind of cool. There'd be a lot of skill in that series. John Cooper versus, would no be a what? riot. Like Cooper versus Babcock. Oh. Like it just in terms like in terms of the hype machine. That would be amazing. Matthews versus Stamkos. Yeah, that'd be a storyline. Yeah. Kucherov, Nylander. I mean, this is not, <laughs> and and they are a deep team. Oh like, yeah, they're deep. Oh deep, Tampa, deep. I mean, right now, if they were playing that series starting tomorrow, Tampa's favored for sure. Absolutely. Like they're like their they, defense. Hedman and Strollman, come on, and even that Sergachev. Like I think, <laughs> which is so not fair. Like they have Sergachev too. Like come on, Steve Eiserman, man, he's brilliant. He's good. Well, and Julian Brisebois, who, who doesn't get talked about so much. He's the assistant GM. I'm not saying he's the total brains behind the operation, but I think that that duo has something. I mean, if I was another team hiring a GM, I'm going to get Tampa's assistant. But wow. anyway, they're just they've made a lot of good decisions. And and even when they ran into cap trouble, like somehow they're like <laughs> trading players, they're like a go between at the trade deadline last year. They get rid of Phil Pilal. I mean, they just like even when they lose, they kind of win. If you know what I'm saying, like they still yeah. they, they handled that sort of loss season well. I thought, they, and they, they didn't they give didn't, Drew Ann away. They didn't panic. They got exa- I mean, Sergachev could be special, and I get why the Habs make that trade. Like the Habs again, because they're extending their window as long as they can. They need a center. They they don't plan on finishing last, and they hope. But like Tampa, I don't know. They could have given him away two years ago or whatever when he exactly held, when yeah he went to Syracuse and didn't I mean, want to be there and held out for six weeks was it and then played in the, the playoffs ninth, they get the ninth pick for him yeah um, okay so uh, w- power players in the East and the West who do you think are the big the big teams in the East and the big teams in the West so Tampa's one of them Tampa's got to be one I mean you you can't I can't look over Pittsburgh of course not I mean it seems crazy. <laughs> They, they are they kind seem, of an afterthought. They but... seem even more decimated. Like after having two of the best centers in the world, I'm not sure what they're going to do with their third and fourth line centers, Carter Rowney. But like you know, they they lost Nick Benino, who is a pretty decent third line center. But I guess you can address that. I mean, if you're them, every every player wants to play there. Might be Greg McKegg. <laughs> Might be. I, I saw an exhibition. They have Greg McKegg. The rise uh, of Greg McKegg. Yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> that guy's been around, man. He's been on a lot of teams. Florida. He was on Tampa last year. Florida. Tampa. Yeah. Toronto, Toronto. Uh, um, yeah. So, but I, I mean, just like they're gonna have Latang back. They won the cup without Latang, and you know Matt Murray has all he's done in his two years in the league is win two cups. So, you know that's a decent he's goaltender. Garbage. He's just garbage. That's he's like twenty three, <laughs> two cups at twenty three, <laughs> and he's like he's got the aura, man. Yeah, I spent a lot of time around him because I, I covered their cup runs. Like he's got the like I'm the best goal in the world aura. Like I, I know he's not recognized as that yet, but. I mean, we can't say he can't get there. He's it's unbelievable. Like, look at his OHL numbers. Like, I I've always tried to figure out what happened here. And he was not a bad goalie, but he was not the star of the OHL. Didn't make the Canadian World Junior Team. And by 22, he's got two cups. <laughs> and he has like the best AHL season on record. Goalie scouting is Man. fascinating. It's like he's got the, he's got the mindset. I think, and I yeah. think obviously it's physical, but I think mental that that position is. It's you, all in your head. You got to be on a different level, man. Ah, so that's that. I mean, that team. If if they don't just fall apart, like if they're not like we played three hundred and eighty games in the last two years, you know, it, <sighs> they. they should, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but they if they they could win again. Caps are an interesting team. Like that's what happens there. Do you think they're better now that the pressure's off? No, no. They they traded away some good players. They lost Justin Williams. Pride of Coburg, Ontario. Absolutely. Da ding. Uh, I just I think that they're worse right now. They lost Nate Schmidt, who was pretty Ooh. good in that first round series against the Leafs. They had Shattenkirk in their top six last year, and, and obviously he left in free agency. I, I they're they're taking a step back. I mean, a step back from winning the the President's Trophy by like twenty points. Like you yeah. know, like yeah. they, they were like resting guys on March eighth because they had it all locked up basically. So talk about teams that should have won the cup. You know, yeah, that might really. actually help them. I mean, you can never do this, but to be in a real playoff race might actually have them in a better position come the playoffs. Makes them sharper. I believe that, and you can't simulate. I'm not faulting them either, but you you can't like the Leafs could have beat them in that series seriously. But the Leafs were playing crazy games right through the stretch. I mean, they lost three games in overtime. 
I don't know if you remember uh, that. Yes. No. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I bet you weren't sad when they got beat out, though. I handled it better than I thought it's I like would. It's like one of those things like you're happy that it happened rather than being sad that it's over. I Like when it went to overtime, I remember like prepping myself, like my inner dad, j- just going, now they might lose here, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> they might lose here, and I want you to just remember how proud you are of this team. And then they lost. Um in the West, we had Gus Katsaros on a few years, a few years, a few weeks ago, <laughs> and Gus said that he doesn't think the Chicago Blackhawks are a playoff team. What do you think? I think they're a playoff team. You think they're a playoff team? I get where he's coming from, though. I mean, their their blue line after Duncan Keith is our old buddy Cody Franzen trying to win a job there, but um, you know they've just been slowly stripped of talent. I mean, it's it's what the Leafs are going to fight, or the Oilers are going to fight. You know, now that they're they're paying McDavid and Drysaddle, they, they've been stripped of the depth that that you need to to be really great in this league. So, I think they'll be worse, but missing the playoffs. I mean, he must be high. What on Winnipeg? Maybe I think it's a so. really good division. Dallas is probably going to Dallas take a step is yeah. going to be better for sure. Mm-hmm. Who do you um, think the real power in the West is besides Nashville? I think you can't. If you went to the Stanley Cup Finals last year. I, I don't think you can discount either of those teams. Edmonton and Anaheim, to me. I was just about to say the, both of them. You know, they played a pretty epic series last year. It was a second sure round. Did. Very underrated. Um, Very underrated, yeah. <laughs> all sorts of chaos, controversy, goals waved off. Yeah. A 7-0, seven, 7-1 seven 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 yeah. game. Seven, yeah, genuine hate. Oh, yeah. How many millions of dollars did Leon Dreisaitl make in game six? Oh, my gosh. So many. All the millions. Yeah. All the millions in one game. Did they... Playoffs will do that. Do, do you think Calgary's a factor? Mike Smith is is just a real X factor in that. Why and whether they score enough. Why did they go with Mike Smith? They had other options. But they didn't really have other options. I mean... Was he the only guy that... Well, you think, that think about Steve it. Li- Who else moved spots? Steve Mason went to Winnipeg. Yeah. yeah. I'm not more sold on Steve Mason. Mike Smith has done it. And keep in mind, there's strong ties to Arizona in Calgary. Uh, Brad Tree Living, the GM of the Flames, was the assistant GM with Arizona. Uh, Don Maloney, the old GM of the Coyotes, is there in his capacity. I'm not sure his title, even some scouts. So there's an old Arizona connection in Calgary, and often people believe in their guy. And backed up by Eddie Lack, who did not have a very good season last year. Mm-hmm. They got that Gillies kid, though. Yeah, they have Everyone two seems good pretty interesting. Yeah, in the AHL. I'm trying to remember the fourth one. Er, me too. Mm-hmm. But, but strong defense around him. Yes. Arguably the best blue line in the league, or certainly in that conversation, just because Nashville's got some injuries right now. Mm-hmm. Um, pretty, that's what they figure, right? Pretty dynamic group. And then, you know, I think they still need some scoring on the right side. Do you know what I'd be curious to see? Because we didn't even talk about him, but Josh Levo needs a new home at some point because I, I don't see a role for him with the Leafs. He would fit perfect. To Calgary, I Burke think. draft them. He just, it makes a lot of sense. They, they need someone on the right side. Like, I think that they've looked at Yager, uh, the Flames. Uh, I think that they were even interested in Justin Williams back on July 1st, another right shot winger. They, they need a little bit more to play with some other skill guys. And I wonder, I mean, that could be, Levo might hit the jackpot. He yeah. might end up playing with, like, Johnny Hockey or something. He'd be, and, and, and he'd be lethal. He's got a great shot. Right. He's big. I mean, I'm not saying it's going to happen. That, to me, looks like a place where it makes a whole lot of sense. Justin Bourne the other day tweeted, uh, you know, Josh Levo strikes me as the kind of guy who will get traded to a team like the Coyotes and score 15 to 20 goals. Yeah, yeah. And I think you just laid it out right there. Chris, there's, the framework. there's other teams. St. Louis needs help on the right. Mm-hmm. You said uh, in your last article at sportsnet.ca that... Somebody actually inquired about Josh Levo. I did. And that the price was prohibitively high. So what does prohibitively high on Josh Levo mean? Six firsts. (laughs) (laughs) I I think the Leafs aren't giving him away for like a fourth round pick or something. Okay. So we're we're talking maybe a draft pick for They're asking for another player, I think. So A player or a player? Player. Player. Okay. <laughs> All right. It's very important. Uh, so I, I just, I sense. <laughs> PL apostrophe R. <laughs> Plur. Plur. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> we should just caption Mike Babcock's thing and just like. Plur. Just a picture of him with white writing underneath. Plur. Good plur. Uh, <laughs> the, the time might come, though, where they do the right thing for him. Because they did that for Frank Corrado. You know, I know it was rocky, but he did eventually get traded to Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. 
Was Holland a trade? Yes, yes. it was. Uh, conditional sixth. They did the right thing for Peter Holland when it was clear he wasn't going to play and it was stretching on. So if, if in fact, Levo just ends up as a scratch again, he only played 18 games last year between the Marlies and the Leafs. And mm-hmm. he had a small injury, but it wasn't – it was largely just the Leafs were so healthy – and they had a good season, and there wasn't a lot of reason to put him in. Even with, though he played well when he got in, he was always behind someone. So if, if he's still in that position and the season starts dragging on, I could see a trade. Was that an example of uh, the Leafs cheating and everybody letting them? How so? Well, he was just on injured reserve for so long. <laughs> well, he, no, he told me he had hip issues, though. Okay. He no, did. I was just I was referring to Joffrey Lupo. Yeah, which we wanted comments, to ask you which, about anyway. How yeah. do you think that's going to yeah. shake out? I think it's done. Well, it looks. You think it's done? You, the didn't deadline's they, passed, right? Be, well, didn't the NHL launch their own? Though? Oh, we have that's to right. remember. That's right. The yeah. reason this story got the play it got is because Joffrey in his Instagram post seemed to suggest that he was healthy. Seemed to suggest that it, it, the system was a joke and that he could have passed his medical. Waiting for a call. I'm awaiting the call. Yeah, which is still up by the way. Ha ha! Failed physical. You know, but still. they passed the window where he could challenge that. So if he's not actually in an official way challenging that he's healthy, I just don't see the league going there and going like, oh, yeah, he's healthy. Because keep in mind, there's a huge bit of gray here. Like Joffrey Lupo, like go to his page. He was he was injured a lot in his career. I don't think medically it's that hard to find evidence he's not. In Didn't a, he have back surgery? Like couldn't he even? He nearly, he had to spend like a month straight in bed. He got like a rare blood infection when he had back surgery in his 20s with the Anaheim Ducks. And like he nearly lost his career. He missed a whole year. And then came to the Leafs and was an all-star. Yeah. And then had, but it had all sorts of stuff. And some of it totally not his fault. Like got hit with a shot in practice and like broke a foot or something. Like just yeah. stuff that's going to happen. Broke his arm with a, Dion he Finoff. accidentally b- blocked a Dion Phaneuf shot. Right. Like, I mean, it wasn't all just because he was fragile. It just he had some bad luck too. So, but my point is, if he's not contending, he's healthy. I can't see an independent doctor going and saying you're healthy, unless he actually is. And he, and he didn't fight it. So, like to me, he made a flippant comment in the moment. He's not pushing it. I would suspect this will just be the end because as soon as the the, the NHL doctor says he's not healthy, the Leafs have said he's not healthy. He's not challenging anything. Well, they're just going to pay him for another year, and that's that. Uh, an article of yours that I read a week or two ago began. The same way that a few uh, other articles that I read about him began, which was the last time I spoke to Joffrey Lupo. Was that, when was that? February 2016, you said? Yeah. Something so the, like the exact context of that was Mike Cormack, who we both report to at Absolutely. Sportsnet, had said, uh, we need a story for Sunday so I, on the Leafs. And I was going away that weekend. I was going doing some other trips. So I needed to like get something that was not of the moment so much. And there had been like minor, and I mean really minor suggestions, Lupo might not play out his whole contract. He still had two and a bit years left to go. So it just happened, as, as happens sometimes, it was his 700th NHL game that night. It was the morning skate. And a whole bunch of people are just saying, you know, do you remember your first game? The sort of questions that guys get asked. But so he was kind of going down memory lane a bit. And so I just waited for the scrum to end. And I said, have you ever thought about like the end? And we had like a really, I was just surprisingly candid conversation about imagining what his life would look like when he was not playing anymore. Uh, talking about how the league had changed so much in his years. And I was looking around and seeing all these young guys dominating the game. And he wonders if he can keep up. And and he, he made a caveat in there. I don't have it in front of me. But he said something like, you know, I hope I still have a long time left. But you never know. So I saved that story for about four days. I believe that was like like a Tuesday just because it was a feature. And, it was, and I ended up writing the story kind of, you know, what it's like to be an older guy in a league that's changing really quickly and you feel like the sand shuffling on your feet. So anyway, he played that night in his 700th game. He played on the Saturday in Ottawa, his 701st game. I, that story went up first thing Sunday morning, and we never saw him again. I mean, total coincidence, honestly. Mm-hmm. But he disappeared, and they didn't say anything for like two weeks. They, You know, they probably said lower body injury or this or that, whatever. And, and that's actually where you came on the show. I think the first time you were on this show, and you said he doesn't have a locker anymore. Right. All this stuff. You broke that here. That's right. So that's right. So it was just weird because we had this really open conversation, kind of like more. I, I wouldn't normally be comfortable asking a guy that, especially in the middle of the season. But he was kind of down memory lane, and I don't know. I felt we weren't tight or anything, but like I just felt like he knew I wasn't. 
I wasn't being a asking, jerk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just sort of like, what's it like, man, to get older in this league, essentially? And and he was really honest about it. And he talked about how he, he has all these other interests and people know about that, but like for him, hockey is everything and, and that he really doesn't want that to be taken away. And it's just kind of eerie because then he disappears. Then I hear he didn't have his lock, locker. Then I'm told he didn't that year. That was in February. They announced he had sports hernia surgery, but on locker cleanout day, he wasn't back for the team picture, which is very strange. Because that same year, James Van Riemsdyk blocked a shot with his foot, missed about the same period of time with a broken foot. He was back for the team picture because he's part of the team. And it just, you always got the sense something was wrong. And so, what I, the reason I started my article that way, like I always wonder when I asked him that, did he already know something was going on behind the scenes? Was it just literally pure luck that I asked this question? Did they let him play his 700th game in a sentimental thing before shuffling him off? I mean, Probably will never have the answer to this unless Joffrey wants to illuminate it, and I can't see why it would ever be in his interest to do that. But uh, the other writer I was alluding to was uh, oh, Steve. Steve Simmons, and I just I just got to read the ex- excerpt because it's so funny. Uh, Simmons, Maple Leafs don't want loophole, and there's nothing he can do about it. Uh, the last of our conversations was accidental. Joffrey Lupul answered his cell phone and said hello, thinking he recognized the incoming number. Shit, he said upon my introduction. I didn't know it was you. I have a friend with a similar number. <laughs> I, th- I thought it was him. If I knew it was you, I wouldn't have picked up. <laughs> <laughs> See, uh, I saw someone was making fun of that, that opening to a story. I actually thought that was pretty good. It's, it's a oh, good hook. It is. It's oh, great. it's great. Yeah. It's great. And, and like, it went viral. Feel, got some attention for the story. I don't feel like that's betraying anything between him and Joffrey either. I mean, it's no. kind of amusing. Oh, I think people are, I mean, and, no. and I think sometimes for good reason. I think people are... are uh, blown to, uh, sorry, bound to blow whatever Steve Simmons posts out of out of uh, a little bit out of the water, just because of the the type of attention that Steve attracts through some of his tweets. Right. He's a controversial writer, controversial I've, guy. That's what happens. I, but I feel like I'm missing something because I certainly like I I would go on record. I thought it was asinine the whole hot dog thing. Like I thought that was just such a cheap shot, and it was. And it was. so my point is, I'm not defending. Steve, per se, but I, to me, first of all, I want to read what comes after that, which is good writing to That's begin the point. with. Yeah, and and I don't feel like he's really betraying Joffrey's trust there. You know, he's he's just he's kind of giving you a sense that he's one of the last guys that has talked to him, if not the last. And there's always been this shroud of mystery around it, and that even Joffrey wouldn't have answered the call had he known it was a reporter. Um, yeah, so, well, that anyway. was the impression I got. It, yeah. it wasn't, uh... but. It's funny, someone in the press box said, like, can you believe he led with that? I was like, are you kidding? I thought that was it's, a great lead. It's perfect. So that's called a story. That's what get, hooks people in. That's yeah. a great story. I get, I get that Steve Simmons isn't everyone's cup of tea, but, like, that's very funny. But, you know, it, this would be crossing the line in a very hypothetical world. If you're writing about someone, and let's say you say, last time I saw him, he was 10 beers deep at this bar, and I bumped into him. You know, something like that that's sort of incriminating him. But, I mean, it's, it's normal for reporters to call people for interviews. It's normal sometimes to catch people off guard. It's normal for them to be wishing they weren't talking to you. I mean, I guess just because I've seen it from the inside, to me, I'm like, yeah, that's perfectly a normal exchange and good for Steve for telling a good story about that. Um, This is the part where, you know, I I know that there's certain people that are not (laughs) jacked about us. Can you timestamp it, please? But, you know, I I think we would be remiss and, and we wouldn't be a proper show if we didn't address what's going on right now. So, you know, we have... Just, you know, everybody knows about Donald what's, Trump's tweets. What's going on? Everybody knows about the NFL protests. Everybody knows about the NBA and the Warriors being disinvited and LeBron calling uh, Trump a bum and Steve Kerr and Greg Popovich speaking out and DeMar DeRozan and Kyle Lowry and Masai Ujiri here in Toronto speaking out about it last night. And and all of those people that I just named have been so eloquent about it. And then, you know, NASCAR not even waiting for Donald Trump and going, you're fired as one of our drivers if you ever kneel yeah. during the anthem. And then Dale Jr. responding and going, well, that's the whole point is you're supposed to be able to do this. Blake Wheeler actually saying something. JT Brown uh, actually getting, saying something. Getting, Jacob Truba? getting death threats. Yes. Was Jacob, Jacob Truba said really... something. Matt Hendricks. So yeah, yesterday you're at Leafs. I guess it's the game day skate, uh, Chris and Austin Matthews talked about it, and he said something. And, and I'm paraphrasing here because you have the exact quote, but it was something along the lines of, "Listen, I I believe that's their right. They can protest anything. That's the whole point. It's the First Amendment." Uh, but he said. You know, for me personally, I find protesting during the flag disrespectful because I had members of my family in the military, that sort of thing. Uh, and then, you know, Nazem Kadri talked a little bit about the slippery slope you get into when you get into these types of conversations. JBR too, I think. What did you, what did you deduce from those conversations that you had with the players yesterday? How do they feel? This is hard, man. 
You know, the the most Greg Popovich honestly put it the best way for me. Like he brought clarity to just because even myself, like you sometimes forget how privileged you are as a white person. It's not something you actively are thinking about all the time. I think at a time like this, you are because you reflect upon it and you really are. I mean, if you're not, I don't know how you're not human right now. If you're not at least thinking about this, this wider conversation. And so it's so hard for the hockey community, I think at times to think about this and it should, it really should. So I think first of all, it was very fair because I had a lot of people on Twitter yelling at me and I'm sure the other reporters saying, you shouldn't be asking players about this. I mean, I get that maybe some people don't want to hear it, but we're not excluded from the world. And this is a, like everyone who works for a pro sports organization in North America yesterday and probably today, but yesterday for sure, was asked about these kind of questions. I mean, this isn't a small thing. But, you know, it's hard for me to criticize too heavily any of the, the players themselves because... There's a lot of things in my own mind I haven't figured out, or I haven't. Or maybe I've taken for granted, and it's hard to expect a 20-year-old kid, for example, like Austin, to be the face of this, because even though he grew up with a Mexican mother and, and a white father, you know, and I, I don't actually know the side of him, but maybe he he didn't experience racism the way certainly it seems a lot of the NFL players and the NBA players that have stepped up and discussed their experiences and, and why they've taken certain stances, and maybe he hasn't thought about all this. I mean, maybe he's thinking differently about it right now. I sure as hell wasn't at 20. I wasn't aware of it. I know what white privilege was. And a half later, and seeing the reaction, and maybe thinking out more. Like, I know he's a big fan of Russell Westbrook, kind of as a guy in his fashion and everything. But, you know, I saw Russell had some really interesting comments yesterday. Maybe Austin went home and watched that, and maybe he's thinking differently today, too. But it's hard for me to, like, take one sentence from any of these guys and say, like, you know, they really screwed up here. I mean, I think the Penguins is a different conversation, and, and Crosby is a different conversation because he's he's LeBron's equivalent, and they, as an organization, really had to think about this and make a decision. Why did they come out with that press release on the day to take in the NFL hashtag and all that was happening? Why that day? I think maybe before we get to that, because there was some confusion on Twitter, where does a decision like that come from? Because people were like, man, their PR guy's stupid. And I'm like, mm, I, I think, don't he think came it came from a PR little guy. higher than that. They would consult the PR <laughs> the guy. guy. Who the Twitter account. Yeah, yeah. To do it. I'm just going to just um, throw it out out there. The audio is a bit wonky right now because uh, our, our computer hard drive ran out of space for some reason. So you're going to hear some camera audio there. But I think Chris made a good point. So yeah, let's, sorry let's start that. with, let's go back to... And I know Chris is completing a, a message here. Um, well, the to my nephew. The question we ended at was... Who makes that choice? Right. The PR. So is it is it the PR person who's told what to do? The Twitter person, as Jesse yeah. so eloquently said? Well, typically, <laughs> this would involve the president of the team, a guy named David Morehouse, who worked actually with Bill Clinton back in the day. So wow. he's, he's a noted Democrat. Ron Burkle, actually, the other owner with Mario Lemieux of the team, has donated lots of money to the Democrats. So strangely, uh, that the top decision makers in this organization are actually democratically leaning. Um, but it would n typically be in a room, I think, with the GM, Jim Rutherford, the president, David Morehouse. They have a senior uh, PR person uh, there that, that used to be like on the ground PR, but that's been around. Then they have a PR staff. I mean, I think everybody would be in on the conversation, but come on, the boss always makes the call. I mean, to me, that's on the president of the team, and he's probably talking to the owners. So Is Sidney Crosby the boss, though? No, not on this. I mean, he's the boss. He he probably has some sway. Like if he wants to fly for a certain road trip a day early or something, and he can probably <laughs> go and say, hey, we should do this, and this is why. But I don't think, you know, it wouldn't have been his decision. He would, again, though, he would be vo he would have been there as a player's voice, or he would have been talked to at some point if he wasn't involved in the actual meeting. But I'm sure a lot went into this. They, they must have been getting asked. That's the only thing I can think about because the news – about Steph Curry came out Saturday. So, I mean, I wasn't one asking them, but I, it would make sense. Other reporters are like, hey, wait, there's this other championship team in our sport. Yeah. And they started pushing the Penguins to get information on what they were doing. It's it's a bad look, though. I mean, it comes out. You don't out, have to say anything. comes out Sunday morning. I mean. Right as those, like, the it's at fever pitch Sunday morning with the NFL. Yeah, like I was, 
it was Sunday morning and I was like eating my popcorn watching. Like, it was like, it was really fascinating. It was like, it was a cool day in sports, I think, in a lot of ways. I realize a lot of it is fueled by hate or anger, frustration, but I mean, it's a unifying day too. There's a lot of people standing together on these issues. And again, even making me reflect on things that in my life, and I assume I'm not alone. I mean, it, it's the kind of day that gets your attention. And, you know, I'm a sports fan too. And so to have them come out with the wind blowing the other way, I just, I don't understand why they had to, why they did it that day. And but the other, sorry. they owned it. I mean, they played that day as well. So their players were available. Sidney Crosby talked about it. Mike Sullivan talked about it. Said he supported it. And, you know, part of this is that I think we're, we are all recognizing that free speech has to be respected. And, and so while I would not, in their situation, advocate in any way to go stand with that president and to help him with his propaganda and what he's because selling. Because he immediately used them as a propaganda tool. Like, yeah. immediately. Minutes later. And, you, and you, let's imagine, like, they haven't said when they're going yet, but they play in Washington on October 11th. So it could be as soon as a couple of weeks from now. They they would play there later in the season too. So I, I don't know when they're going, but it could be in a couple of weeks. And you don't think that picture? You don't think Trump isn't going to be on some high horse about that? And again, to me, this isn't political. It's this not. This is about something much different than Republicans and Democrats. I agree. And just because the guy in office is a misogynist, like known, noted, long time before he got elected, like, like audio and video recording, numerous yeah. things. <laughs> oh, like, he was just joking. This guys. isn't a matter of conjecture. That's how real men talk. It's a matter of fact. Shut up, shut up, Floyd. You know, things that have happened since then, he's taken very clear racial stances that are just not what any country should think and should have the leader of their country be... Not the least of which is, you know, a country that is has been through this many times before. You know, this is supposed to be stuff that we're past. Well, but it? he's using it. That's the worst. He's using it to divide people. He yeah. saw what happened in Virginia... And he's using it to say, well, some of these people aren't so bad. Like, he's appealing to friggin' neo-Nazis. NFL players are sons of bitches for kneeling during a flag. There's supposed right. to be a neo-Nazi rally in Peterborough. Today? Uh, I think it's on the weekend. Uh -huh. Peterborough fucking Ontario. That ah, doesn't surprise me. So I think this is why it's good that it's coming to sport. I think that the hockey world needs to look at itself. And look, I, I grew up in a small town. I'm a white guy. I, there weren't many people of color in my town when I was a kid. I've been associated with this sport professionally since I was 18 years old. There's not a ton of people of color in the NHL, be it in media relations, be it in front offices, be it on the ice, be it referees. Mm -hmm. The more I think of it, even people covering the sport. I mean, there's, there's certainly some. Some of these people are my friends. You know, it's some, like it's not, but it, it's it's a long way off being representative of even what Toronto is as a city or what Canada is as a country or what North America is, no matter how you view it. So I think that the hockey world has to think of its place in the wider world because what's comfortable or easy in hockey shouldn't just be comfortable and easy. I think that, that the questions being asked by these other athletes, and what's interesting here to me is that all these players have cover or all these teams have cover because you have LeBron James, you have... Tons of influential people across the NFL. You have Steph Curry, Russell Westbrook, like the most recognizable athletes in North America, like just really taking a strong stance here. You have guys like Greg Popovich and Steve Kerr, like really articulating from a position where, you know, they're, they're white people talking about this. And I just feel that the hockey world needs to step up a little bit. But I'm not going to hammer them only on yesterday because – Maybe not everyone has thought about this because I wasn't it thinking about this. It took the NFL a year to get it because certainly Colin uh, Ka Kaepernick was the only guy doing it last year with right. maybe a couple teammates. It's taken them this long, and it was it wasn't until and I think I don't know if you saw Shannon Sharp's rant on uh, Undisputed last night. Yeah, it was epic. It was Un unbelievable. So like such a brilliant thing that he said. But what you know, but basically the gist of the conversation was, are you kidding me? It took you this long to get this? Now we've got Jerry Jones. Yeah, and, nice to see you, Ray Rice. Yeah, and 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 uh, yeah. Bob Kraft and all these guys yeah. that donated to Trump going, now we're gonna be unified. Right. Now we're no, gonna Ray take Rice. a knee. Uh not Ray Rice, no. Ray, Ray Rice Lewis. was Ray Lewis. Ray Ray Lewis, yeah, who took both knees. Sorry, um, I know like Ray Rice is also bad. Players. <laughs> but the 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 I think what gets me and I, I don't, and I wanted to ask this question because I don't know the answer to it. Because there's, this is, 
This entire discourse is, is uncomfortable, and it should be. It should be uncomfortable. We should be examining ourselves and going, what, what is it that we want to be? What is it that we want our kids to say about us? What do we want to accomplish in this time? Because things are changing whether we like it or not. Do you know convenient here, though? Hockey literally just got together and had a press conference three weeks ago and said, this is what we want to be. Which you can wipe your ass with now. Right. Yeah. But it's called the Declaration of Principles, and it's literally, it's pretty straightforward. It's not that long to read. Look, we got the Pope. <laughs> and <laughs> they got and the Pope. one of the principal tenets is hockey is for everyone. And I feel like by going and standing with the president, you're supporting him. Even now, though now the it's Penguins not because don't he's a Republican, be right? It's because it's him. Well, it's because what's been said and right. it's what's happening in the other sports. And to me, it's a message that, that suggests that it isn't for everyone. And I know that they're going to say they don't intend it that way, that they're trying to stay out of politics, but you can't stay out of this. Like, this is bigger than... You, you can't just say, well, we'd go if it was this president. Like, this is big. This is serious. This has gotten the attention of the sports world. And, you know, I just think hockey has to think... People in hockey really have to think about this stuff because a lot of their experiences are similar to mine, and and it, it's from a different place than where the people that have you know where Carl Kaepernick came from. It, even though it's you know it's a pretty small, I've traveled all around all these places, but like sometimes you just take for granted certain things, and I think this is a period where those that are from predominantly white or European backgrounds, uh, you know, a lot of the hockey, it's Canadians, it's it's. People from Sweden, that's two of the top three countries in the IHL, representative by numbers, have to think about this a little bit more. And this is an opportunity to do it. That's that's the positive side of this. And, you know, I'd like to see more players follow Blake Wheeler and, and you know, really say something about this. Because, ho- to me, hockey looks really bad in all of this. I mean, it's hard to define hockey. There's a lot of people in hockey. That means a lot of things. Professional at, at hockey least, in North the America. NHL. Yeah. But the NHL does not come out of this looking very good. Okay, a couple questions, and these are, these are ones that I've been I'm just dying to ask you since yesterday. First one is, is it unfair of us? You know, we already kind of established, you know, 20-year-old kid, Austin Matthews, you know, he's not the captain, he's not, he, you know, we, we acknowledge that at 20 years old, your perspective on life is a lot different in 30 than it, than it is at 30, and being almost 30, I can attest to that. Sidney Crosby, you mentioned, is the face of the game. He is the LeBron James. He is the, um, you know, the Bryce Harper. The, you know, he's the big face, right? He's, fa- it, he's fair to criticize. Is it unfair of us to expect a guy, and I don't want to take away from any of the charitable initiatives that he's done because he's done many, but is it unfair of us to expect Sidney Crosby, and I don't know the answer to this, to be, to be a champion of social change? And I, I have my opinion on this, but I don't want to, to give it. I want to know what you guys think, all three of you. Is it unfair of us to ask a guy who's literally never taken a stance on anything other than let's win some hockey games to go, this is wrong? Someone else go first. Jesse? Uh, my disappointment comes, uh, there's this thing, fuck you money. And Sidney <laughs> Crosby, LeBron James, Steph Curry... Jerry Jones, they have fuck you money. Dave Chappelle had fuck you money when he told Comedy Central, I'm going to Africa for 10 years and coming back and doing whatever the fuck I want. And Sidney Crosby has the ability to say whatever he wants for the rest of his life because he can do whatever he wants. He has enough money to live. He, he doesn't need hockey. Yeah. He can go live his life. And he has the ability to say whatever he wants. Beyond his enormous contract, incredible endorsement deals. He can yep. never do anything ever again. He'll be fine. He'll live his life. And he took... He decided to take no stance, and it's disappointing to see somebody in a position of power who millions of people listen to take the stance of nothing. So that's my opinion on Sidney Steve, Crosby. you're well, next. And, like, to expand on what you're saying, like, I feel like Sidney Crosby is kind of a mystery, and, like, we've talked about for over 10 years how he just kind of says nothing, and we know very little about him. And then, you know, the one opportunity he has to take a stance on something, to show us something about him, this is what he shows us. And it's shitty. Like, I met Sidney Crosby. I made a really funny video with Sidney Crosby. And I... I don't know. It's just all a little tainted. Like, it's going to be harder to joke about all the big butt jokes like I used to make. Like, he's not... He's not Oz Shucks anymore. There's he can't a, be there's a stink. There's a stink about it. And it's not taken away from who he is as a hockey player, for the love of God. Like, he, he's the been the best guy for the past decade. That's not what we're talking about. We're expecting guys 
to uh, be better than this. You know, I, I saw some people arguing about Ron, LeBron James's athletic legacy <laughs> yesterday. Like that. What? That's not what this has to. No. Th- there, there's nothing to. That's not what this is about. Um. You mentioned a, a word there, and Bob McKenzie mentioned it on the TSN broadcast yesterday, and that's divisiveness. I was really angry yesterday, and I'm going through, well, for the last couple days, just on Twitter, and I was I was going through this. Twitter's a tire fire right it now. It sure oh, is. Fuck, oh, my it's God. It's terrible. And I... Never tweet. Never tweet. Never... Oh, sorry. What, what's that? Never read the comments? Uh, oh. Sorry, I interpret that as always read them, yeah. <laughs> which, which is what I always do. Read every comment you've ever been given. Yeah. I took a step back. I go, okay. What's going on here? Like it's it's good to slow things down sometimes and compartmentalize them. The kneeling thing and the warriors not going to see the president are two very different issues. Yes, they are. Yes, Incredibly they are. Incredibly different issues and they were painted as one thing and then the whole the the kneeling thing which was supposed to be protesting one thing was then turned into this care this this uh, care bears countdown unity thing. It's it's not the fucking same. And then the war like the warriors were taking a stance against something. It, it wasn't police brutality, and they have in the past. In fairness, the NBA, many stars in the NBA have made it very clear where they stand on that topic. But it's not the same. So you want to talk about divisiveness, it's almost like a package deal when it comes to ideologies. If you believe the Penguins should be going to the White House, I feel like people felt pressure to take a certain side on the kneeling thing. This whole leave sports alone, stick to sports, like fucking the president's not sticking when, to sports. When has sports ever sports. not been political, though? Beyond that, okay, or because some for social people, change. Jackie Robinson, Jesse Owens, come uh, on, like, are we kidding? Yeah, but some people will tell you to shove that up your ass, and they're wrong, but they will. We, as you've put before, we work at the toy store. Like, this is wonderful. We just, we spent the first 90 minutes of the show talking about the Leafs, and it was fantastic. You think we want to talk about this shit? We have to! We have to! Because the other option is do nothing I will not be, be able complicit. To look, I will not be able to look my kids in the eyes when I'm older and say I did nothing and said nothing. Whatever small impact I have on the world, because I do have a microphone Mm -hmm. in front of me and I know it's small, I get it, I only got like my 24,000 little followers, I'm still going to make an impact with that. Yeah. So like you you and I both really liked history in school. Yes. And I remember learning things in history and going home and go, Mom, Dad, fucking really? And then they'd be like, all right, let let me give you a little background. Because they lived it. Our kids are going to come home one day and be like, what the fuck? Really? That guy was president? Yeah. That guy who's I hope. probably head of a TV network or in prison at the end of all this. <sighs> I don't know. Jesse, do you have more Back to say? Back to the original I've, question, though. Yeah, yeah that's what Sydney's Sydney Sydney responsibility. Crosby. Is, is Sydney right. Crosby Sorry. responsible? Yeah, absolutely. He's got fuck you money. He's got fuck you money. Fuck beyond you the fuck you money, The team though. is there because of him. The team's there. And not to mention, like... But he has the fuck you money because he can play hockey really well. Yeah. Does he have to be more than that? That's the question. I don't know the answer either, but that's... I, j- I just want to hear an opinion from him. Right. I just anything. Just give me something. And he gave us nothing. I'm going to tell you... It's like Michael Jordan back in the day. Never yeah. take an opinion. Yeah. Tiger Woods never took a stance on... But anything. they never had to face this. This is different, right? They never had to go and say... Like, Muhammad Ali took a stance. Right, but right? most of the people we call among the greatest athletes, for some reason... But that was like when... Use the, the that was during the good times, right? Clinton... The Clinton, uh, you know, the worst that he could say is that he he had an affair. Okay, yeah, fine. Yeah. Oh, but know. then you're gonna get flamed for what about this? What about that? Right. We're in, we're well, in the but age. Her of, emails. We're in but the age of what about? Here's because this person did this, I don't have to listen to them. Well, and th- now we're just none of us are listening to each other. So hold on. Back to the Sidney Crosby <laughs> Sorry. thing. Back to the Sidney Crosby thing. Here's where I think. Yes. Here's where I think it's a problem. Mm-hmm. It allows people to think that they can be let off the hook on this one. I got to tell you, that picture with President Trump is not going to age well. Nope. And uh, this is not a, re- a Republican or Democrat thing. I think pe- pe- people basically know that if I was if I was living in the States, I'd probably be a Democrat. Trump, Trump's Trump, not hold a on, fucking just hold Republican. On. He's like, not. And that's the point. It's not Republicans versus Democrats. This is as as close to good versus evil as I've seen in my lifetime. And I mean that. 
This is a person who genuinely does not wish well on anybody else other than himself and his closest family. And even some of those members are, you know, pushed to the oh, side. Oh, and the second but he he's has to be to worried say, about 300 them. million people. He's supposed That's to be putting the, the yeah. people above himself. And yeah, like let's ask Puerto huge... Rico what they thought about the football game the other day. Like, fuck. They're they have still, no power. Yeah. So I, I, so my, my, my expectations, I think, of Sidney Crosby were that, you know, you are, you do have, you're from an area, by the way, in Nova Scotia, that is one of the most racially charged areas in Eastern Canada. Yeah. For... There, when I was there, the summer I got there, there was a race riot at Coal Harbor High School. Oh, 2008. The whole uh, I was there. the whole Robert E. Lee statue getting torn down when I was there uh, this past summer. There was all this talk about. Um, oh God, I wish I could remember the name of the person who was supposed to get their statue torn down, and there was supposed to be a um, there was supposed to be a protest there. God, I wish I could remember who it was. But to answer your question bluntly, no, Sidney Crosby absolutely does not have to take a stand. It'd be really nice if he did. He's, you know what? Let's like let's talk about glass ceilings. His glass ceiling is greatness. Mm-hmm. Muhammad Ali is above that legend. Sidney Crosby, if all he wants to do at the end of his life is look back and have us remember him as a very ho- good hockey player, that's his right. That's all I'll remember him as. You know, fucking, you know. Put some pucks in the net, set up some goals, win some rings, sell some skates, sell some bread. Yeah, and I'm going to be disappointed in that because I know he could have He's capable more. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, like, we talk about, like, people in our everyday lives, like, uh, at our jobs. You know, if you only do what's in your job description, you're not going to get a pat on the back for that. That's the shit you're supposed to do. It's the above and beyond stuff that gets you promoted, that gets you ahead, that makes your company special. Yeah, to Chris's point earlier... Um, Tiger Woods, Michael yeah, Jordan, here, Wayne Gretzky. <laughs> those guys. I, I don't need to speak more than anyone else on this. I well, mean, those guys the were. Answers. Those guys were. Uh, you know, they didn't have to take divisive stances on things, right? They didn't have to. Now, in that time, you're talking about. I mean, you know, there were. Uh, it's not like that, the world was ever perfect. No, but it no. wasn't. I don't think that they ever had a, a president quite dividing the country the way this is you know i think even you know even during the worst days of the bush administration i think people spoke out about the iraq war where were you in this where were you in that okay stop with that shit can you at least acknowledge what is happening presently mm-hmm. is bad yeah and i think that's the thing is that so those guys were never but forced it's one thing it. that separates lebron in this is that and i feel like he's done this before he doesn't he, need to do any of this but he's not but he's doing it. he's not afraid to step up Mm-hmm. Remember, it's during the uh, NBA Finals, and he has a house in L.A., and someone had written something racist on his garage yeah, or they, on his the, the N word. Yeah, and he, but like he, he takes that and stands like, I don't know. He says even at, what did I he say? I feel like even he's as... he's more than just an amazing athlete, and he's obviously that. Like that guy is really standing for something. I do you know what's funny? I don't know Sidney Crosby, but I know him a little bit, and. He's got a lot going through his mind. Like he's actually, honestly, a thoughtful guy, and that's why. That's what that's, I don't that's doubt what's So annoying about this. I don't doubt that. But honestly, like he's not. You know, I've met some players that will go unnamed because it's not productive in this conversation. But that literally just like shoot a puck in the net really well, and they don't even really think about why. They've just got like this this gift. whatever, yeah. some kind of gift, and they just do it because that's what they do. That's sort of they haven't like thought twice about why it is they do that or what their choices were in that. Sydney's a very thoughtful guy. That's why I wonder, first of all, if he might make a second statement at some point. Maybe he'll rethink something. Maybe not. Maybe he's already made it and we've missed it as we were recording. That's true. That has has happened. That would be wonderful if at the end of all this the Penguins go, you know what, never mind. (laughs) Well, Well, it still could happen. It it could. Um, And, you know, here's the thing. I want to respect people's rights here. Well, him too. Yeah, it's listen, just really what we're saying is we expect more of him. With that, we w- if you want to be the face of a league, is that part of it? Is my question. I think should that be part of it? Is that a job expectation? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah, we expect okay. more of you. Woe is you. Like, there's a reason we do. There's a reason the, we do. You're the face. But let's make no mistake. Like he's carried hockey for 13 years. Yes, he has. But we're not asking him to carry shit related to hockey right now. But that's what I, I'm you saying. Know hockey what I mean? has like, to be better. So Hockey I think it's on yeah. him. Okay. It's on him to. I mean, if he think about it, if he had to come out and said something along the lines of what we've heard other athletes say, I think 
yesterday plays out different in the NHL. Because he gives cover for everybody else. Well, if Sydney did it, then I can do it. I mean, this is it's one part that, you know, in hockey's like it's one of my favorite things in the world. It's given me my life style and everything. But the the one of the things that frustrates me about it is how conservative people are, and I don't I'm not talking about a political leaning, but conservative in the way that, that everything like this gets approached. That so much of it is that no one wants to stand out. But I feel like if that guy had a stood out he would have given a lot of cover for other players that maybe had more to say yesterday and didn't step up. Mm-hmm. Maybe Austin had more to say. Maybe Nazem Kadri had more to say. And, or maybe they have more to say now. I mean, but now they thought maybe about they it. didn't want to be the one guy in the league. Who's Austin Matthews? You know, that's that's how players think. I know they they shouldn't. But He's that's a how human they're... being above everything else. I mean, as much as we glorify the sport and the Leafs and everything that's going on, I mean, he's he's got feelings. He grew up as he's an American. You know, his mother is a visible minority. He 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 probably has some thoughts on this, but maybe he doesn't feel like, first of all, maybe he doesn't feel informed enough to air certain things. Maybe he doesn't feel comfortable enough surrounded by a bunch of white Canadians asking him the questions. Maybe he doesn't feel like he should be the one to support. I mean, we, there's a lot of unknowns, and it's not just him. I mean, there's guys on 31 teams that might have might be thinking more than they're saying. Well, but now, because the Stanley Cup champions made their statement and Sidney Crosby, the well, no, he wasn't MVP this year, but former MVP has made his statement. Like Anything that would be speaking out against that is now officially speaking out against the company line. The company, the company line is, is that. Will an NHL player kneel for the national anthem Never. this year? JT Brown said maybe. If there's one, it's him. I mean, give him a lot of credit. He was the one who came out against Tortorello, and Tortorello said no one on my team at the World Cup is kneeling. And, you know, he funded, put some money in to have a statue pulled down in Tampa. He's put himself out there more than he's the one exception. Look, his dad played in the NFL. Yep. You know, maybe he's got a different view on these things because he's been growing up in a different sporting culture than just hockey that, that he's been around. Or maybe just he's, you know, I don't know JT that well. I met him a couple times, but I don't. But, the, but maybe he's the one. Mm-hmm. But I, I doesn't feel like something. Hockey's so much about you know because it seems like that's kind of what the Steelers were trying to do. Although it's I see there's like Alejandro sta- Villanueva kind no, of wrecked statement that and- upon statement afterwards. So now I'm even well, more confused. Yeah, but then there's but- stuff about him as well. Well, because he he walked out too far and then got caught when the na- the anthem started. They were supposed to. He was going to just stand in the in the hallway, but he walked too far out the hallway and then the cameras caught him and he's uh, like, well, I can't be seen walking away from the national anthem. So he was stuck, so he apologized to his team and that sort of thing. So I understand. Listen, I get it. Um, yeah, but, th- this but is, there is not going to be, on either side here, there's not going to be perfection in terms of um, you know, if you're a conservative, you're liberal, whatever. What we have to understand is there is common decency. Whatever your political leanings, there is commonality in what we all consider to be decent. And what right now is being challenged is what that is. What is common decency? Yeah, what, what is what inclusivity? Being- be, what being a liberal or a conservative means because I, I don't know. No, it doesn't know. even. I've had so many that, people Steve. tell me Steve. what I am. It's what it's the things <laughs> we like, have. What? No, no, it's the things that if I was a conservative and you're a liberal, it's the things we have in common that are being challenged, which is why we're so divided. Yeah. It's not. It's not our ideology. It's our. It's it's the things that binded us before, that now seem to be miles apart. Yeah, and symbols, I still think. Sorry. I still think that there is so much. That binds us together. I don't have a problem with people that are conservative. I might be a little liberal leaning, but there's certain conservative values. I'm like, Pff, I get that. I'm behind that, and I think vice versa. I also, I, I wonder, I wonder at the effect that the internet, text messaging, Facebook, all this stuff are, are having. Because when you, like, I have a rule in my house, and this is going to sound really stupid, but I have a rule with Caprice that we don't fight over text message ever. Because anything That's you just say, a good rule. <laughs> anything you say written can be taken out of context, taken the wrong way, Inton- intonation, the way you say something, your your facial expressions, your hands. I'm an animated guy, I talk with my hands, I got a weird face. It, yep. it uh, yeah, it, <laughs> like, it matters. And I wonder if a lot of this divisiveness isn't coming from that same problem on Twitter and Facebook and all the other places. Well, you no, know, the president went to Alabama and well, that too. sons of bitches and pitted humans against each other. For it's, sure. I, and I, I totally agree with that, Jesse, and I'm not – I'm sorry. I'm not trying to diminish that. I'm wondering if – I think before that, I think this was coming – this has been coming for years. 
This has been this has been a thing that's you know we were talking way before the election even started about how nasty people can be online, right? And how it's pushed people off into their groups. And I think he's taking not, advantage of that. It's not, it's not even an online thing. Um, Kaepernick's original protest was he sat down for the anthem. First of all, he never knelt. He only started kneeling after a Navy SEAL told him it'd be more respectful if he knelt instead of sitting. A Navy SEAL told him that. And the original protest was just because there were so many wars against the police and minorities. So he decided to sit down to show, hey, I'm against all of these injustices that are going on in America. So it's happening. In but what life. about the soldiers, Jesse? It's not, <laughs> it's not just online. It's people being killed in streets. Agreed. In I know. What, I, agree. I, I realize what you just said and that it's based on history and facts and nuance. But what about the soldiers? Mm. I think we, something we ought to remember, too, is that the flag does not just represent the military. No. The flag is Sorry. representative of the military, but it's also representative of teachers, social workers, well, and broadcasters, <laughs> uh, anybody, everybody. It represents the country as a whole, it not just the military to institution. Do with the flag. It's, it's Agreed. So many people keep losing the point when they talk about it. It's not a national anthem protest. And even it if it did. protesting black injustices in America. Yeah. And even if it Nothing did, the military that. is not one organism, gelatinous blob. It's a series of individuals, some who support him and some who don't. Mm -hmm. Just like yeah. the regular world. Anyway, it's a it's a very complex, a very tough issue. Um, but Chris, I think you're right in saying that hockey does not come out of, out of this looking good. And I, you know what, Gary Bettman was on Sportsnet yesterday with Ken Reed in PEI and said, I don't think uh, people come to our games to see uh, politics. And I thought, mm -hmm. I, I was I I was not even disappointed with him at this point. I just sort of expect that. I think that's the most Gary Bettman statement I think I've ever heard. I don't expect Gary to be progressive in any sort of way, but that was sort of telling. Well, this is not something that Gary's a lawyer, and this is not law. I mean, I guess it's about the protection of the law, the, the, the fundamental law of being an American, but it's it's about a little bit more than that. I mean, I, I'm not putting this on Gary Bettman. I, I'm I'm honestly just saying it to other people that have a similar background to me. If that Roger are Goodell can make a statement, though. If Roger freaking Goodell, and now we know why he did but it. But see, everyone just is angry right now. So we're looking for all these people to be angry at. Yeah, you're right. You're right. And I just, it would just be nice if the hockey world own this one a little bit more. And really just was more respective of the other sports leagues. Or some of their fan bases. Or the people that you want to play the game. I mean, they're going to China because they want to make Chinese hockey players. Those players won't be white, most likely. Do you know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. they're, they're they're trying to make this sport bigger. We all are, and have it be loved by more people because I do think it is a sport everyone can love. But I just think that it's got a long way to go. But in a lot of ways. But on, when you get to this big of an issue, you can't just sit it out and say, "Wait, we're apolitical and this doesn't matter." You know, like that doesn't exist in we, this. We need somebody to. We need more Brett Blake Wheelers, and and there were a few, so that's why I don't want to totally no overshadow. No. But there there there's a few people that uh, listen to Blake's thing, and you know he, tweet, he was, is he the only hockey player that's really tweeted about this? From what I I don't follow a lot of hockey players to be honest, because they don't it. tweet much. A few have like because <laughs> oh, they don't have much to say. Weirdly, <laughs> <laughs> people uh, people have been keeping a close eye on like retweets and likes and stuff like that. There's been a few players who have been caught. You know, favoriting or liking stuff related to Trump, but like I think like Braden Holtby or his family, something like that, has has been seen uh, basically approving the Warriors not going to the White House. And right. there's been these little subtle things in terms of actually coming out and saying something themselves. I don't think uh, anyone really before Wheeler and a, a bunch of the Jets. Yeah. Winnip so Winnipeg is the strange front lines of this movement in hockey. Pete, I mean, Pete Blackburn was like, "Oh, sure, the resistance <laughs> is in Winnipeg." <laughs> well, and but you know, it's, it's got to start somewhere, yeah. man. It's part of the reason Matthews was asked. You know, the the bright future of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Well, he's an American. Blake mm -hmm. Wheeler, I believe, is an American. Matt Hendricks was on Team USA at the World Championships. Uh, Jacob yeah. Truba, I think, is also American. All the Leafs Americans spoke. were asked. Connor Carrick as well. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. JVR. What did they have to say? JVR, he he was just he, you know he really defended the First Amendment. He was he said talked a lot about that. You know what Connor Carrick said is that he thinks hockey hasn't confronted this head on because hockey hasn't been challenged in the way the other sports are, and that he himself is kind of in a contemplative 
mode about it. And, and I kind of got the sense he wasn't taking a pass because he is a super thoughtful guy that, that he wanted to really be sure what that he believed in what he said. So huh. maybe he's we'll not to one re- to pass up an opportunity to talk. No, but he, but he wasn't trying to get rid of the questions. He wasn't no. hoping he that just, that answer. And it's okay to not be prepared for well, an answer. It's okay to think not, about it. I guess we can't ask every person in the world to take a huge stand on every issue. You know, I'm not blaming the Leafs third pairing right defenseman. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I am. As a, <laughs> no. Ken, you want to be angry at everyone, Adam. You know, I'm passionate. <laughs> but I'm even willing to go so far as to say it's not just Gary Bettman's problem. It's not just Crosby. It's just that those people, if they really said something, would have the impact that I think we'd like to see. And I'd, I'd like to see. I want. I, I just think, man, I hope. I hope some of this gets salvaged and occupied. I don't know where this is going next, though. Even in the other sports, no one does. I'm not sure. Is this Sunday in the NFL? Is it? Is it all gone? Did is we it forget gonna, about it? I mean, I know it won't go away. It finally bled into it, baseball. Is it going to recede a little bit? I saw Chris Archer, the, the pitcher for the Tampa Bay Rays, said that basically he was told by his teammates they didn't want him to do it. They, they didn't want him to, to kneel or sit or whatever he was planning on doing. I mean, I, I don't think we've clearly heard the end of it, but I don't, is this going to keep growing or is it just going to recede into the background? You know, that's, that's an unknown to me, but if it grows, man, I hope there's some people in the hockey world thinking twice. For the stick-to-sports crowd... Take it up with Trump. Mm-hmm. He made it about sports. And, too and, bad. and that's, let me, that's your enemy. That's let, who and let you me need say to be this, at. too. If you are a conservative, if you voted Trump, if you are a Republican, whatever, the issue is not with you or your ideology. The issue is with decency, straight up. And it's how we treat our fellow people. And I think we need to make sure that that is said. Because I know, that I, as I said to Chris on the way in, I was like, man, I can't wait to talk about hockey with you. But I sure as hell am not looking forward to the fallout from this fucking subject. I'm so tired of it. And we still have to hit it. Still got to talk about it. Still got to give our opinion. Still got to do it. I cannot wait. Cannot wait till we move past this in a positive, constructive, and take a step forward as a society sort of way. I don't know how long that's going to take, but I sure as hell uh, do not like where it's going at the moment. Jesse, you got anything else? Um, I don't consider myself one of the smartest people or the most knowledgeable about politics, but I always side with team human race. I always say that. <laughs> I'm always on the side of people and other humans because life is hard and someone's trying to make life difficult for people and I'm not on that team. I mean, so, it's a simple, but yeah, I think the right I way to put it. For, I'm cheering for team human race. And I'm on team and Jesse. I feel, <laughs> like I feel bad for like constantly being like, and now we go to Jesse. For his comments, no, but like it's, it's, it's a fair thing to do because I am a visible minority, so I definitely feel like I should say something. Yeah, well, you know, three white guys yeah. going, "Here's what I think," <laughs> you know, without asking you. So, wow, I figured you should jump in. <laughs> I mean, um, that just makes sense. I would, I would shut you down if I didn't want to say. <laughs> I'm not afraid to do that. Um, Chris, thank you so much for making time for us today. Um, Man, that went quick, and that was a. It's two hours. Oh, show. Thick show. Yeah, it was uh, two C's. Especially, especially what you had to say about how you're thinking inwardly. You you echoed a lot of the things that I've been struggling with for the last year, year and a half. Um, and I I just want to say I appreciate you saying it because it was said in a way that I don't think I could have said it. I just have not been able to articulate it in that way. And in so many ways, you're very good at that. That's your strength is articulating things that I think people you know find complicated with hockey. And so. Thank you for saying what you said, um, and thank you. Hockey isn't that complicated compared to the last half of this. Yeah, podcast, that's true. So. Um, and I, I really appreciate the fact that you came on and made time for us and told us all that you told us about the Leafs, man. Like this is, this is going to be, uh, I think, a special and an exciting year. Who knows where this goes, but it should be a lot of fun. It's going to be an awesome season. It's not. I'm not just speaking to the Leafs, but. It, I'm legit pumped, and if, if we're being totally honest, because how can we not at the end of that? That was like, open the vein, and like not every season am I excited for, just because sometimes the summary feel isn't long enough, or you don't, maybe the storylines aren't getting you. I mean, you, you see Line a score a couple goals oh. last night, Matthews had a great night, His goals were McDavid amazing. is just going to like rule the league this year. You talk about best lines in the league, that this, line they have in Winnipeg is a destroyer of worlds. This should, is so exciting. It like, should just be called the Line A. I had, I had one <laughs> One like a little personal question for you though. All right. Um, on Thursday, I have my fantasy draft for my hockey. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> some sleeper picks I should be looking at. I have Woo. a better question. Is this cheating? <laughs> <laughs> Insider knowledge. Yeah. Who? So what counts as a sleeper? 
Uh, someone who's certainly not like McDavid or Matthews or Nylander. It's, it's or... a bidding draft too, so you have like two hundred dollars. Oh, so like, who can I get on the cheap? Who's going to overperform? That is dollar amount. I'm so bad. Whose PDO sports. is going to explode this year? A typical eight goal scorer who you think has a shot at fifteen or twenty. Twenty would be nice. <laughs> twenty would be nice. <laughs> Zach Hyman. He was the first name that came to mind, but I don't know. No, I need somebody like no you can't be drafting Leafs, though, because yeah. I'm assuming it's mostly Toronto-based crowd. The, the entire yeah, I they'd know it. Like Leafs Dallas. are going to be overvalued. That's like, true. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah well, last I... Year, um, yeah. Freaking Komarov went like the second round. <laughs> 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 That's so stupid. Oh, tell me you're not in a league that values hits. Oh, yeah, yeah. hits is a stat. Matt oh, Martin, Matt my Martin God. was on a team, because... Yeah. I made a mistake years ago of uh, valuing penalty minutes too high, and I think the first overall pick was Zen and Kanapka. <laughs> yeah, it was... uh, Cody McLeod always gets picked. Up on the <laughs> well, okay, so maybe Chris, someone, someone along think? those yeah. lines. I'm gonna have to give you some. I'm not even punting on this. I just. Can you send me an email? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm comfortable, and you guys can share it too. I'm not. I'm honestly not trying to avoid it. I just. My brain is not working right now on that. All right, so um, we're gonna get an email. Well, if if the league is designed as you described, and he's not. So do you need? Go- is the goalies get heavily valued? Goalies. I find goalies like tend to win you fantasy leagues. Yeah, because there's a strict goalie category, so goalies have their own four stats. I think it's wins, save percentage. Goal like I would bet percentage. on like Scott Darling, probably Ooh. going a little higher than people think. You know what I mean? Because good I defense. think I think Carolina is going to be good, and I yeah. think he's good. But there's an unknown there. He's going to play a lot. Mm-hmm. I think Cam Ward's days are done. Steve Mason? Maybe, but that's risky. Yeah. Well, yeah, I don't think I'm gonna you, like, you like living dangerously, though. You've been Certainly a Leafs fan all this time. I so. know. What about Antti Ranta? Yeah. He'll you play know. a lot. He'll play a lot, and the Coyotes are stronger on defense. You can get him dirt cheap. Mm-hmm. You like You could probably team. sneak him in there. Well, I guess it's, it's your bidding. you like your third goalie, though. Yeah, but you could have a team that's like an expensive goalie and then maybe a guy like Darling and then maybe a guy like Ranta. Yeah. yeah. Be a pretty flushed out little I gotta be able to think of somebody that like no one's really thinking about that's gonna probably have a good year. He's score <laughs> while you, while you're thinking, if the league is designed the way that you've described, he's not exactly a sleeper, but Dustin Bufflin would clean up. He's gonna get a ton of points and he's gonna get a ton no, of penalty he usually minutes. Goes high every year. Yeah, and Bufflin. especially with the crackdown. Yeah. Like he's oh. he's gonna spend a lot of time in the box. Yeah. yeah. How does Martin Jones in San Jose? I mean, I like I, I don't know the if they're Sharks as good. I don't know what they yeah, are this year. I don't know. Are they gonna be good? I mean, if they're, I think they're as good as Martin Jones. They're not gonna be bad, but anyway, Chris, Anyways. any thoughts? Uh, I'm dead. Sorry. You know what I would do? Pick up Josh Levo if he gets traded. There you go. That's what I would do. There we go. <laughs> that's my guy. If Good he gets suggestion, traded, Chris. That was, that was, that was good. You sounded a lot like Adam, but no, that was, that was a really good one. <laughs> Chris, it was a pleasure having you on, man, and I hope we can have you on again soon. I know that the next time will probably be over phone because that's, that's just fine. the, the way it is. That's fine. Whatever, I'll come in. How's uh, that? that? That'd be I'm not great. not that busy. Oh, no. <laughs> Just every show and every game and every radio That wasn't even game. modesty. I'm serious. We could probably find a time. All right. Well, we will. Again, we'll check up with you in a couple months. And uh, and if you want to come in sooner, you you walk in here anytime, okay? So by then you're saying that's when Matthews and Nylander are 1-2 in league scoring. And you guys... Can you imagine? I, I've actually really... Whether it's this year or another year, I'm excited to see what happens when the Leafs are like fully on their way and you guys are just going to be like little giddy school children well yeah. you already kind of are but <laughs> but now it's Watch. like yeah now it now it feels like like it's thursday and friday's tomorrow don't get and spoiled it's by it though that's my one piece of advice okay i remember going to game three of that cap series and it was just so it was like a love in it was like a big civic celebration and i was thinking it will never be this good probably because the expectations are going to just make it be more dread-filled or, like, I don't know. Remember the joy, because it's, it's still meant to be fun. <laughs> Remember that if they're in the second round, they got to the effing second round. Joe Bowen's <laughs> voice, like, he is a play-by-play guy. It has a lot of subtext to his voice, and the subtext was, Holy shit! They're <laughs> leading the series! No way! I never thought in a million years, and here they are! And then Game 4 happened. Uh, all right. <laughs> we will be back Thursday. Thank you so much, Chris, for coming on. Leaf season starts next week, isn't it? I'll be in Winnipeg next Wednesday. Oh, my God. Line A. Matthews. Uh, our next show That's will be. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah, because Matthews Wednesday. is better than Line A. Oh, okay. 
You so. see, because proven. <laughs> Won the Calder. End of debate. It's done. Um, next week, we'll, or sorry, next week, two days from now, will be our first Just the Three of Us show, I think, since July. Yes, we do. Sorry, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> So, hey, thanks so much, Chris, and we'll uh, wrap it up later. If you want to take it off, you can. No! (laughs) Follow the guys on Twitter, at Steve underscore Dangle, at Adam W-Y-L-D-E, and at Jesse Blake. The Steve Dangle Podcast. Brought to you by Panago Pizza. Order at Panago.com and stuff your face with deliciousness.